you know, you and I have talked offline a little bit about um, situations that we've all seen that have made the news that are horrific, like the George Floyd situation and stuff where uh, you see law enforcement personnel do things that no one trains. Um, and uh, we've seen the effects of that. And th those are people I have no problem saying, you know, that right there is 100% wrong and should never have happened. And the, the unfortunate thing is that's what makes the national news, right? And it point, paints all of us in the same light. Um, despite the fact that I think percentage wise, we probably have the same percentage of bad apples that exist in, 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 in any profession. Um, and, uh, but those people definitely shouldn't be working in law enforcement. And I think as a profession, we've put ourselves in that situation. And so we still have more work to do in terms of, you know, restoring faith and, and confidence trust. and trust in law enforcement and stuff. And so hey everybody, thank you for joining us. Um, today we'll be talking with Matt Langan. Matt Langan is chief deputy in Collin County. Um, in the Collin County Sheriff's Office, and he is also a veteran of the DEA. So he was in the DEA from 97 to 2001, um, and he also, because his father was a foreign service officer, he also uh, traveled overseas a lot and had a very unique childhood. So part one, we're going to be talking more about some of those aspects of his childhood and then also speaking about the DEA and that process of how to get in there and what that looked like. And then in part two, it's going to be a little bit different um, in that we will be talking about more his views on policy, what the drug war has actually looked like, um, and what it looks like for him currently because he's also still in law enforcement. I did also want to bring up really quickly, we had some malfunction with some of our equipment during this episode, and so we might be using either webcam footage or something else from my face because the... The camera that we were using for my actual face was the one that had malfunctions. So we will have everything that's going to be really high quality and awesome for the guest. But whenever I'm speaking, it might look just a little bit different. Um, I appreciate you guys just having the patience with that. We are dealing with those issues and they will not be occurring for future episodes. Thank you guys so much. Really looking to looking forward to your feedback regarding this episode and, and potentially having other individuals on that are also from that uh, federal law enforcement space and a few of those other alphabet agencies. Thanks again for tuning in. Hey man, thank you for showing up. I know this has been a long time coming. It has been. We, we met back in November. That's right. And how do you recall us meeting? <laughs> I remember you walking up. I was working off duty at a Dutch Brothers here in McKinney, and uh, you came walking up to the uh, window to place your order, and I was standing there uh, simply directing traffic or whatever, and you came over to me and struck up a conversation, and uh, that's how we first met. I remember it differently. I, rem <laughs> I remember you approaching it because you saw Austin in the back of my shirt. It was my Krav shirt oh, okay. that I had on, and you were like, are you, are you in Austin? I was like, yeah. Like... <laughs> What's up? <laughs> and then we just talked about your dad a lot. Well, now the way you're describing your reaction makes me think that I might have missed something there. Like you seemed like you were guilty of something. Like maybe I should have. Maybe you should have searched the car. <laughs> maybe the, that's on you. Missed opportunity. <laughs> no, I remember. I do remember um, striking up a conversation with you pretty quickly. Uh, you're a, a good dude. I could tell right off the bat. And um, and we did. We started talking about families and stuff. We started yeah. talking about you know places where you've lived and places where I've lived and stuff. And um struck up a friendship. I didn't yeah. know that you did this. Uh, this was literally just germinating in my head the previous weekend, I think, or the following weekend. It was just something like it was, it was around that time. And so when we met, it was just the, the background that you had of being a DEA agent for a period of time. It was just like, right. oh, this could be really interesting. Like, it's not every day that you run into someone that's been in the alphabet agencies. Right. So it's just like when you do, you're just like, oh, that's really unusual. That's right. And then on top of that, like a lot of people have a curiosity and even romanticize, you know, the military, the alphabet agencies, you know, national security, all these things because right. we see movies and Jason Bourne and all this stuff. That's right. And they're curious. That's right. So when we first met, you were describing to me, I think that you'd gotten your undergraduate degree in business or something. International you business. A couple of mm -hmm. jobs and stuff. And you were thinking about getting into some different, uh, a different line of work altogether. And I didn't know it was a podcast um, then. I think I later found out about that. But you were talking about places where you've lived and stuff. Mm -hmm. And then started asking me questions about my law enforcement background. And I did tell you um, kind of how I 
where I worked and how I first got into law enforcement and stuff. And obviously you have a gift for this because you're easy to talk to. And I'd said stuff to you that I don't normally, you know, uh, say to somebody when I first meet them. And mm-hmm. stuff. So, but it was obvious that you're, you were, you were a good person and, uh, you've got a gift for this type of thing. And since then I've watched, as we were talking a little mm-hmm. few minutes ago, I've seen some of your uh, previous episodes on YouTube uh, just to make sure that you were, this is a whole legitimate thing before <laughs> I, I agreed to come on here. It's a sting operation. Right. <laughs> but no, you, uh, and over the course of time, I've gotten to know you a little bit. And of course you came to the sheriff's office yeah. here a few weeks ago. So we got the sheriff's permission for me to come on here and tell you a little bit more about my experiences in the long Yeah. And I definitely also need to get your permission to go into the jail. Uh, David invited me out and I wanted to get cuffed and everything. Well, it sounds like that first time we met, that was a missed <laughs> opportunity for me to actually get you in the jail and you could be given a first-hand account or something. But this is no, the-, the worst story that I ever had with, uh, my brother was sitting in the car with me and we got pulled over. My lights weren't on. I was picking up from practice from um, the Toyota Center and a uh, cop pulls me over, Frisco cop, and I was driving my mom's car at the time. And he pulls me over for that reason. But he's like, hey, like, are there any weapons or drugs in the car or anything that I should know about? And like, without dropping a beat, I look at him and I go, I'll be honest with you, man. It's my mom's car. I don't know what could be in here. Right. Well, you understand why law enforcement asks questions like that. Of course. For their own safety. Yeah. Make sure. Okay. No, no, no. And I mean, we had a great teacher in high school where she kind of explained and gave us a little bit of empathy around what law enforcement, like the, the, the kind of anxiety that they go through okay. in, in traffic stops. And so she was like, Hey, if it's at night, turn on your lights, put your hands on the wheel, just so like that they, they feel comfortable okay. and it makes your experience that much more different. Right. And so I've had those conversations, but I've also had conversations with other friends who have had really poor interactions. Right. And so it's like, it's, it's a mixed bag across the board. Right. So I appreciate that you had a teacher that gave you that perspective, because one of the things I think we're going to talk about here uh, in the next few minutes is how, even though I mean, I'm obviously sitting here wearing a uniform right now, uh, we're regular people that are got into this line of work, but we're human beings that happen to wear uniforms and are performing law enforcement services and stuff. But yeah, but we're, we're human beings first. Right. And we just uh, and so there, there are certain things that we do just to ensure the safety of those around us and, and our own safety including asking people if they have, you know, weapons or anything in their car. Which is fair. I don't know why you guys think anyone would tell you. Um, that's just, it's funny. You know, it's funny. <laughs> One of the things I kind of wondered the same thing when I got into law enforcement to begin with Daniel, I kind of thought, well, who, who agrees to a search of their vehicle when they have contraband or something like that in there and was surprised to see how often people actually do that. Really? Yes. It's one of the things that I, it, it happens routinely. Is it just like suggestive where they're just like, Hey, like I kind of need to, Look, and they're just like, yeah, okay. I, I don't fully understand. I think that they think, uh, part of it is I think they think if they give consent to search, that law enforcement will then take that to mean, oh, there's nothing in my vehicle, and then the, 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 they won't then search it. Because so they're reverse psychology you right. guys? Well, some people have explained that to me after the fact. Like, I, I didn't think you'd actually, you know, or I, I didn't think that a search would actually be performed. Um, it was my attempt to try to, you know, kind of thwart you all by saying, sure, come on and look, thinking you wouldn't do that and stuff. So, but you'd be surprised at how many people, um, allow or consent to searches their vehicles or their residences when they actually have contraband in there. Uh, typically what we do in Collin County though, is we obtain a search warrant and stuff from a judge to make sure that anything that we find after the fact is definitely, you know, allowable in court and stuff. Yeah. Like yeah, that, yeah. So. I mean, I feel like that's due diligence on that's your right. part. That makes sense. Right. Um, so Looking obviously at the fact that you were in the DEA, um, would you want to be a DEA agent in the 2020 era? Absolutely. Okay. Well, it's good because the reasons that I got into this line of work um, are, are the same. So just to back up, as I've shared with you mm-hmm. um, previously, my dad used to work for the State Department. So we, li- we grew up living all over South America. I lived in Peru, Bolivia, and Havana, Cuba as well. And we don't have really? a level of relations with... Cuba to have a U.S. embassy, but there's a U.S. consulate there. But every place I lived, except for Cuba, we actually would have, we lived in houses that were much bigger than the one we could afford in uh, Arlington, Virginia, right? So we had extra bedrooms, extra space. We would have people that would stay with us from time to time that were, you know, coming into the country or or exiting the country. Mm -hmm. And from time to time, we would have DEA agents that stayed with us. And I was really impressed. This is when I was, you know, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 years old. And I was really impressed with the men and women that stayed with us and uh, their experiences. And um, and obviously, I grew up in a household where government service was praised. I mean, my dad talked about, I mean, he was a foreign service officer working for the State Department. 
and he praised uh, service to others, that your job and your career should be more about uh, more than just earning a paycheck. It should be about giving back to your community and doing stuff like that. So I was already raised in a, a household where, the, where those types of things were praised. I didn't have anyone in my family who worked in law enforcement. So I'm the first person in my family that, that worked in law enforcement to work in law enforcement. But I saw the impacts that the impact that drugs had on um, society, and then, as you know, as I've shared my story with you a little bit, uh, drugs definitely impacted my family uh, as directly as well, mm-hmm. and so that caused me to go into uh, uh, law enforcement in general, but then also the DEA specifically. Yeah. So, can you kind of dive a little bit into that story? Sure. So. Um, I was 27 years old. I went to undergraduate. I obtained my undergraduate. So, sorry, more more about the, the 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 primary reason for getting into law enforcement. Sure. Um, I was 27 years old at the time. After graduating from SMU, I'd worked on I worked on Capitol Hill mm-hmm. for a, a member of Congress. Ran his reelection campaign. <clears throat> worked on the on the House Judiciary Committee, and then was working as a lobbyist for AT and T. Um, where I was making more money than I've ever made since, actually, but I felt very unfulfilled because I still had these, uh, you know, this <clears throat> my dad's voice in my head uh, saying that your job should be more about earning a paycheck and you should be doing more for, for, for your society and stuff like that. And while I felt like I was contributing to society and by volunteering and doing things, being active with my church, I didn't really feel fulfilled and stuff. And so all of a sudden I I just came with the idea that, you know, I really want to have a career in law enforcement. I was physically fit. I was uh, a younger man, had more hair and, you know, was bigger than I am now (laughs) and thought I want to, I want to pursue this. So I applied to several different local law enforcement agencies, but I also applied to the DEA and the FBI at the same time. And the DEA was the first to hire me. My, from the from the date I applied to the date I walked into Quantico to begin basic agent training, it took six months. So during those six months, I took my written test, my physical fitness test, a polygraph, did all that kind of stuff, passed the background. And then the day after Thanksgiving 1997, I reported to Quantico for basic agent training. So if, if the FBI had reached out first, would you have gone that direction? So the FBI actually contacted me while I was in the DEA Academy to tell me that they wanted to wanted me to complete the last step, but that they were had a hiring freeze going on at the time. And I told mm-hmm. them at the time, I was actually, I was in Quantico going through basic agent training with the DEA and was not interested in pursuing a career with the FBI because I thought the DEA was was much more interesting to me. Well, that and I feel like you've got those like personal ties to why you aren't a fan of just drugs and the impact that it had. That's right. So, I mean, a little bit about that. My, uh, my, we have some substance abuse issues in my family. My, both my parents were alcoholics. My dad was an alcoholic really? for years, but then got over that. But at the time my parents divorced, I was 11 years old. And all we knew at the time was my mom had problems with alcohol. She went out to a treatment facility and 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 came back, but was living in a, in, a, in another apartment. And then uh, she actually uh, left with who I later found out some years later. My dad didn't tell us this at the time, but there was kind of a local drug dealer that um, my mom started using uh, uh, harder drugs and ended up going off with this guy for like several years. And we kind of lost touch. And then, you know, years after that, my mom tried to kind of you know, reconnect with us and stuff. But um, the impact that had on me, I'm, I'm obviously a, a white guy who was growing, living in Arlington, Virginia, in the suburb. And um, it's just proof that, that the drugs <clears throat> that are entering this society affect not just the inner city people, but, in, but folks who live in suburbs. And, and I think people have a preconceived notion in their head, uh, people who are junkies, you know, people who have drug problems, they kind of have an image that appears in their head and they're not thinking, you know, a good looking, uh, successful, uh, middle-aged white woman, you know, who just got hooked on hard drugs. And, uh, it, it really did an impact on my, had an impact on my family and stuff. And so that's one of the reasons why I decided to, at the time, dedicate my life to, uh, uh, fighting the drug war, if you will. Yeah. Have you, I mean, this, I'm just kind of curious now because my family also has a history of alcoholism. Has that, has that bug ever kind of crept into your, your individual life? So it's funny because when my dad, uh, he was, he was raised Catholic and he raised us Catholic too. But when, when they went through their issues, again, when I was 11, 12, 13 years old, 
we stopped going to church altogether. And then uh, my dad went to several treatment facilities when he was when I was 17, 18, 19. And finally, the third time he went, it, it kind of it, it took. But when he finally got himself sober once and for all, he gave me this book, and it was the the central theme is basically the the eldest children of alcoholics and the likelihood that you have to kind of fall into those same uh, that same lifestyle and stuff. And so I read that book when I was nineteen or twenty, and that had a strong enough impact on me to where when I'm going to SMU, you know, from time to time I would I would enjoy a few drinks and stuff. Mm-hmm. But I felt like, oh my God, I'm drinking the second night in a row. I'm falling into these traps. I, I can't do this. I need to spend that third night at the library, definitely. I can't go back out to a bar or I'm becoming going down the same path and yeah. stuff. So as I drink a beer. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I could ask the same question of you. So what did 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 your parents' issues have any impact on 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 you? Definitely, I have a hard and fast rule, and I'm breaking it currently because you tricked me. Um, <laughs> this was I blame you wholeheartedly. Um, earlier, I asked him; he'd made a joke about like wanting a beer or something, and I'd completely forgotten. Like, there's a reason he's in uniform. This isn't like any sort of statement. It's just you. Your job actually takes you after this conversation to continue working. Like you still have other stuff going on. Yes, sir. Um, And so he'd mentioned like grabbing a drink and in my literal brain, I was like, all right, cool. And so like I went to crack a couple of beers and he goes, no, 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 I was just kidding. And I'd already cracked it. So I'm like, I can't like pour it down the drain. So, so my hard and fast rule is I don't drink by myself. I don't do any vices by myself. Okay. Um, It's only socially. And so it's, it's because of that, because of, because of the, addictive personality aspect that I think that I have um, genetically and sometimes that I see it in some of my family. Um, I don't, I don't smoke. I don't do any of these things unless I'm with friends and then it's, you know, smoke hookah or smoke a cigar. um, And then (laughs) it's have, have a beer. Have I smoked weed? Yes. Do I smoke weed? No. Well, just um, to be clear, just, so outside this room, uh-huh. there were these things that I noticed that were on the, on a table <laughs> that they were actually, they're titled earwax candles. And then your partner, Eric, said, uh, before he got in his car to drive yeah. to Austin, said, he offered, he said, well, do you, want, do you want to try one? That's actually something you burn in your ear and it removes the earwax. And I said, that's the type of thing I'd probably have to have a beer first before I did something like that. And you then offered up a couple beers and I, I was like, no, Eric. You weren't quick enough Daniel. on the draw. Daniel, I was like, I, I've got to go to an event after this. Plus I'm in uniform. I wouldn't do that here. So yeah. So uh, that was, uh, that was your fault. I okay. agree. <laughs> I agree. I'll, Wholeheartedly. I agree. I'll, I'll take that. <laughs> I'll take that. Um, so talking about um, basic agent training, what what did that look like? What's what's the initial kind of recruitment and training process? What does that look like for the DEA specifically? Sure. So, um, well, like I, was, I said a minute ago, it consists initially of a written test, and then you have to undergo a personality profile exam of some kind. And then you're polygraphed. Then they do a background, a full background investigation. We really have to write down like every address you lived in for the previous, I think, ten or fifteen years. List a bunch of references, um, people that they subsequently go out and contact, and they ask each one of those references to give them three additional names of people Whoa. that knew me and stuff and could speak, could talk about me. And so I had people that were contacting me that I had completely lost contact with in years that, that were saying, "Hey." Um, I understand you're applying for the uh, a job mm-hmm. of the Department of Justice. Some background investigator called me and stuff like that. So um, it's a it's a very thorough uh, process. And they say at the time, because this is 1997, I'm not sure what the exact numbers are now, but at the time they said for every person that made it into Quantico, there were 1,200 ap- applicants. Whoa! So each basic agent training uh, class with the DEA starts off with 50 people. Same with the FBI. And they stagger them. So each class starts every two or three months, and it's about a five month, five and a half month training uh, process. So, um, and then, you know, about two months into it, you actually f- are informed or told what office you're going to go to. So I, I hired on in Washington, D.C. They never send you back to your office of hire because they assume that you have ties and people who know you. So when you're working as a DEA agent, they don't want to put you, they don't want you to work in an environment where people could recognize you in the middle of maybe. Or you could be emotionally compromised. You could be, that's true too, but you could be working in an undercover capacity and, and, and somebody comes across and says, Hey Matt, how you doing? And stuff. And you're like, well, wait, I'm, I'm, <laughs> my name's Joe. What right. are you talking about? <laughs> you know, so they just, so I, I found out two months into it that I was going to get sent to Detroit, Michigan. Um, and I was fine with that. That was one of the places I actually had, yeah. had chosen because uh, little did I know I'd lived growing up in Arlington, Virginia, 
Um, I'd been to New York and Boston and several East Coast cities, and I thought Detroit was like most East Coast cities. And I found out after getting there that uh, unfortunately it isn't. It's a pretty rough area. Yeah. Um, you can tell what Detroit looked like back when the auto industry was booming and stuff. The architecture, it, you know, it's beautiful and stuff, but industry is just dried up with what happened with the auto, uh, the big three as they call it, the automakers yeah. and stuff. And so. Um, there's not a lot of opportunity in, in Detroit. Uh, yeah. I mean, even in, I remember in 07, 08, you know, when we saw the real estate kind of prices plummet, there was at one point in time, a house, I think it was like 1500 square feet available in Detroit for four grand. Right. And it's just like, wait, what? Like that's cheaper than a used car at that right. point in time. And I, I, I would bet money that that house is beautiful. A lot of those houses that were very cheap uh, at the time that I was there, for just a few years, um, in 98 to 2001, um, there were a number of properties that I thought, man, this is this should go for like $2 million, $3 million. If that property was here in Frisco, it, it would cost several million, but it was just uh, because of how depressed the economy yeah. was there and stuff. But like I said earlier, I mean, it, it, it it's heartbreaking. Detroit was heartbreaking because um, I think six or eight months into uh, my assignment there, there was uh, uh, the bus drivers went on strike. The school bus drivers went on strike, right? And so I remember driving in one morning and seeing this this mom holding her kids' hands at the corner and um, uh, walking away because the school bus didn't show up, right? But who, who shows who, who drives by every day? The drug dealers, right? So um, you you see that, you know, while all men are created equal and, and, and that's all true, uh, opportunities don't exist. They aren't the same for everyone across the board and stuff. So, um, Detroit was a pretty rough area to, to raise a family in at the time and stuff. So I applaud those families that stayed on the straight and narrow and, um, had their kids doing the right thing and stuff when there are a lot of hurdles and impediments in the way. I mean, I think, you know, humans, like, like every, every other mammal, like we, we would sometimes prefer, I would say most of the time prefer the path of least resistance. Right. And so like, when you kind of follow that, my parents did the same thing. Like every time that they got a better job or made more money, they moved us more north because South Dallas, super rough. Right. At that point in time, Richardson was also getting rougher because it was South Richardson. Mm -hmm. Plano, like it was like Plano was getting better. Like that was the first time where I wasn't a minority um, in a in a school racially. Right. Um, everyone, I mean, I think every every school that I went to, I was more or less in the middle socioeconomically. Like they're like, you know, when we were poor, we were fucking poor. Right. When we were less poor, we were less poor, and there was other less poor kids around me. Right. And eventually, like we were like, okay, we're now like, you know, encroaching into the middle class. Like we've gotten to the point where we can buy this house in this you know economic downturn. And luckily, my parents bought this house for just north of a hundred grand. Uh -huh. But like now, I think it's considerably. Uh, worth more just because of the area and everything else. Right. But at the time, like, dude, this was even this was a stretch for us. Right. Um, and, you know, they just did what they could. Mm. And I think a lot of parents in a lot of those situations, they do what they can. That's right. And they hope for the best because, like, they can't make their kids decisions for them. They can just hope that they've influenced them enough and raised them well enough in that direction that they make a good choice. Right. Um, in regards to BAT, um, what was the fail rate? And then was there any additional training after basic agent training? So my class actually, uh, I remember, had a record number of females in a basic agent training class. There were eight females in my class. We had 42 males and eight females to start. And I think we graduated 42 or 43 at the end, okay. which is typical um, because if you ever score less than an 80 on any written test or a physical fitness test or a practical um they packed up your stuff and, and they sent you out of there and the first time that i witnessed that it was just a couple weeks into it and somebody had failed a, a quiz that we took got less than an 80 on a quiz and during a break in class um they came in these instructors came in they packed up all of that um, person's stuff and boxes and put it down at the the basically the entryway into this building we were living in and they had a super subtle there and they put this guy on a super subtle and he was gone. By the time we got back to class, the little placard where uh, he sat was removed and the stuff was gone. And so you can imagine all of us were kind of looking around and wondering, hey, what happened to, and I can't remember what the guy's name was. Yeah. What happened to so-and-so? Ghost number one. And so everybody for the next hour was pretty wide-eyed and paying you know, a, a lot of attention to the instructor that happened to be you know, presenting whatever it was at the time mm -hmm. and stuff. But then you saw that play out, you know, every couple of weeks and stuff. But really what the impact that that had on me was, again, not having 
I was still at the time a little bit intimidated about getting into the law enforcement career because I assumed that people who got into law enforcement were like second and third generation law enforcement people, grew up in households where, you know, you learn a lot of that stuff like through osmosis and stuff. Mm -hmm. Here I am, you know, just a, a regular average dude that was getting into this line of work. And a lot of the people that, and I didn't have any, any law enforcement experience before I went to Quantico, right? A lot of the people that were DEA applicants that that were in my basic agent training class had prior law enforcement experience. And so I was really, you know, impressed with those folks. And, but that kind of, you know, further heightened my anxiety level. And I wanted to make sure that I did well enough to, to, to pass and get through and get to the end and stuff. And so the whole time I was in Quantico for five and a half months, I was on pins and needles and making sure yeah. I did the best I could ran as fast as I could shot as well as I could academically was as squared away as I could be and stuff. And, um, it all turned out well for me, but we had the answer to your question is we graduated, I think 42 or 43, which is pretty much on par. It's pretty much average. Now the FBI typically graduates a higher, uh, um, number of people per class. Uh, they don't weed out as many people, but, uh, is their bar higher initially? So their, their training is a little bit different in that, uh, first of all, they have to learn a lot more, um, uh, about applicable laws and stuff because an FBI agent is responsible for a lot of different things, right? Money laundering, they could get into terrorism, they could get into all kinds of things. Whereas a DEA agent, you just have to know a couple of federal uh, laws that apply to distributing drugs and then, you know, possessing drugs and stuff like that. So academically, it's probably a little bit, e it, I would say it's easier to go through basic agent training as a DEA agent than it is as an FBI agent. However, I think that the physical fitness training, the practical tests, our firearms training was a little bit more strenuous than what the FBI uh, um, had at the time. Of course, it's 1997, all things. Have yeah, yeah, yeah. And how many, uh, out of your class of 50, how many would you say were fresh grads versus folks with experience? So I think I was one of the younger, well, I was 27 years old at the time. So I was, um, one of the younger ones, um, I think there were about four or five people that m were slightly younger than I was. Um, but most of them had prior law enforcement experience that were at least three or five years. Okay. That may, I mean, that makes sense. That's, I was curious about the law enforcement versus military experience. Cause I know some other agencies, they kind of prefer folks that have a little bit of a military background as well. So there were a few that had uh, military service, but not many. The DEA, you have to have a, you have to have graduated from a four year institution with a GPA 3.0 or higher. So they're all, you know, university graduates. <laughs> um, and I'd say about a fifth of them had prior military, but the rest of them didn't. Did those folks tend to do better later on as agents? Were they more effective agents having had that background? Or do you think the folks that came in as blank slates as fresh grads with no law enforcement background tended to do better, I guess? I honestly think I couldn't discern after he graduated a, a pattern like you just described. In some respects, and some of the instructors told us that um, you'll have an easier time learning what they're trying to teach there in Quantico if you don't have prior law enforcement experience and you haven't been through another law enforcement training academy because the way they train is a little bit different than the way the other law enforcement agencies train or lo other law enforcement academies train. For example, like just uh, firearms, they teach what's called the isosceles triangle where you stand with both feet on the line and your hands are, are like this, right, in the form of mm -hmm. a triangle, in the shape of a triangle, right? Whereas other law enforcement agencies, I guess they kind of blade themselves and so for some of these folks that had a lot of experience, their first couple of days out on the range, they didn't shoot as well because they were forced to shoot in a different, uh, a different manner. But I do think that people who had prior law enforcement experience and had been through an academy of some kind probably had an advantage because they, they had a better idea or a better sense of what they were getting into and what the environment would be mm -hmm. like. Um, but I think that... Um, I mean, yeah, it would probably be easier to get through the academy itself, but wouldn't necessarily make them better better agents or have them like have them pick up some of the other more academic stuff as quickly I guess. that's right because we're all learning a new job kind of together at the same time so um and the da was real intentional at the time about hiring people that had different backgrounds they didn't want everybody they didn't want people that had the same type of experience which typically in law enforcement is a little bit of military experience and then you know civilian law enforcement experience and and um and I know that's part of like the DOJ's strategy with both the FBI and the DEA uh, to prevent things like groupthink and people from, you know, seeing things the same way and stuff. So uh, there's value in hiring people with different backgrounds, people who speak different languages, have had different types of experiences in their in their life. Um, 
Was there a lot of like racial diversity or did you just see it? I'm just genuinely curious. I mean, it was also 97 and like, I wasn't even here yet. Where, where were you? I was in Bosnia. I got here oh, in 98. Okay. That's, that's a, well, I, was, I was like, how old are you? I was like, you weren't even like on the earth. <laughs> I'm yet. actually 21. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the, I was going to say you're old enough for that. The, uh, At least. <laughs> it, it's funny you bring up race because my, um, my experience is a little bit different. Obviously growing up for the most part, living all over South America, mm-hmm. my parents were real big on us, not, um, uh, uh on us assimilating in whatever community we lived in and whatever culture we lived in, whatever country we lived in. For example, they didn't let us go to the commissary to buy the American food that was there at the embassy and stuff like other embassy kids could. Mm -hmm. I was always envious of that. Like I want to go to the commissary and buy Cheetos and stuff like that. Why am I eating these other potato chips and stuff? But because through those experiences though, you, um, I really value and appreciate that because you see things from a different perspective, but I, but living all over South America, I was around people that uh, had a different skin color, uh, right, and spoke a different language. Even at the American Cooperative Schools we attended, <laughs> they were attended for the most part by uh, folks who lived in those communities and stuff. There was typically embassy kids and like oil executives kids would go to these American Cooperative Schools, right? But whether it was like in our neighborhood or at school, um, I was in the minority, right, and then. Coming back to uh, living in Arlington, there was a very mixed community. My, my next door neighbor, who was was and is still one of my best friends, was a guy named Tyrone Bird, <clears throat> who ha- happens to be a black guy and whose parents were African-American as well. And they were by far the smartest people on our block. Like Tyrone's mom had her master's in education and worked at the U.S. Department of Education. Tyrone's dad had the coolest job ever. He was a licensed psychologist who saw clients like at his house. And I was like, <laughs> blown away at their education level. Like we, but. I grew up <clears throat> when we lived in Arlington every weekend, either Tyrone slept in our basement with me and my two younger brothers, or I slept in his basement with him. Right. And so that's just kind of, how I grew up and with the struggles that my parents went through, Tyrone's mom was the one who would ask about us all the time and re- remind me loudly in front of my dad that like the grading period was about to end, make sure you got your grades up and stuff like that. I was like, you know, kind of, you know, come on at the time. I didn't really appreciate it as much, but yeah. she was like a mother figure to me. Mm-hmm. And uh, in fact, I walked her down the aisle when Tyrone got married uh, when I was in my early <laughs> 20s. But then, you know, you go to a place like Detroit. And I, I played ba- I played a lot of basketball when I got to Arlington. Yeah. And um, and I was in the minority there, too. There was you know, most of the people on my basketball team happened to be black guys. Right. So they weren't playing Willie Nelson on the bus and stuff. Yeah. So I didn't. But that was how I grew up. I didn't think anything differently. I don't have a a racist or sexist bone in my body. But how did how did that look with within your class? Did your class have any like your your oh. DEA class did they have any sort of um racial diversity or yes. did it tend to skew um there was racial anyway. diversity. So for example, there were three people that hired on from Washington DC at the time. So mm-hmm. when I went into this class of 50, there were three of us from Washington DC. One of them uh, was an African American female. Uh, Michelle's her name. I won't use her last sure, name. Sure, she sure. was like the one I was actually closest to all during my time at Quantico for five and a half months. Um, we leaned on each other for you know our studies and stuff. Um, when I would finish my runs, I would run alongside her. She was uh, excellent at a lot of other physical fitness events, like top of the class. But like a distance run, she hated it and stuff. So I'd run alongside her when I was done and I'd be like, you know, talking to her, whispering in her ear and stuff. And she'd be, you know, kind of cursing me out a little bit saying you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm like, no, I'm here to help you and stuff. But so she's, uh, um, so there was some, there was some diversity uh, in my basic agent training yeah. class. Yeah. I'm, I'm always just, I mean, I'm just curious how things look. Cause like it, it was also at this point in time, you know, f- what, 15 years ago? 1997. Right. Am I, am 2001, I, about 20, 25 years ago. Is, oh, man. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> my sense of time. Dude, COVID has messed up my sense of time completely oh, now. I, I'm going to blame... No, I'm just not. It's <laughs> definitely me. Um, so when looking at the at the candidates that were selected, was there any sort of pattern in your class or later on when you saw with other agents of a, of a certain personality traits? Not a specific like they have to be an extrovert and a blah, blah, blah. Right. But like, did you see any sort of uh, commonality in, in one or two traits that like really stood out? You know, you know so like I was telling before, um, I was anxious when I was first accepted, right? Because I thought everyone else knew a lot more than I did about law enforcement, even coming in, right? They were products of 
families that had law enforcement and a lot of the folks that I had even met when I first got there, like down in the lobby as we're all checking in, I, I knew that there was one guy who was a, a trooper in South Carolina. There were several people who worked on the border as border patrol agents mm-hmm. and stuff that were there. And I thought, my gosh, man, I'm really behind the eight ball, right? These folks r- are really uh, squared away. Um, but I didn't notice to your point about a, a certain personality trait Um there were just as many, you know, introverts like myself, for example, as there were extroverts. Um, and there were just as many people who were, you know, that type A kind of law enforcement quality that a lot of people have, which is understandable, right? I mean, part of the reason why you get into this line of work is even as, as school kids, you can go to any fifth grade or sixth grade class and pick out the kid that thinks that they want to be the one that makes the final decision, that mm-hmm. decides right from wrong and you know, protects, you know, the the weak among the class. Or bullies them. Like that. that also happens. <laughs> well, <laughs> hopefully we're, we're weeding those people out. Um, but the, uh, um, but no, I think that there's just kind of an equal distribution. And, and I, I think that speaks to the, the background process that the Department of Justice uses to select people for federal law enforcement. How do they, how do they choose who, I mean, aside from you can't be in your city, how do they choose if you go to San Francisco versus if you go to Detroit versus if you go to Dallas? For your first assignment or, you know, otherwise. So they typically will take people who um, are ha- had lived for the most part in like a big city and maybe put them in a smaller city in another state, right? Interesting. It's people who had maybe, you know, grew up in a small town, they'll put them in a big city in another state. Um, people who grew up in the south, they'll put them in the north. People who grew up on the east coast, they'll put them in the west coast. Um and that's kind of it. The one thing that I, I think jumped out at me when you and I were talking about me coming in here the, uh, and, and doing this with you today, I remember the last step in the hiring process. And because you're asking so many questions about this, I get called back. And of course, this is after I've done my written test. I've had like a panel interview. I've had one-on-one interviews with people. I did the, I did the polygraph. You know, I did the background investigation and they called me back to talk about something else. Then they come back and say, well, we got like one more interview. We got one more thing we have to do. And they'd all but told me that I was in, right? And I'm thinking, my gosh, like, what do I have to come back and talk about? So I go back in, I'm in a room full of like three or four people and it was a small room like this. Um, no knock on your studio, Daniel. I don't care. Okay. <laughs> the, uh, There's only two people in here. <laughs> <laughs> but, we, uh, but we're talking and they're asking me questions about my background, my, you know, growing up and stuff like that. My brothers, my family, my previous work experiences and stuff. And at about the two hour mark, they go, somebody gets up and they, they, we, they take a break and somebody says, well, we, uh, do you, you want to go eat lunch? <laughs> and I thought like, well, yeah, but I'm still kind of anxious because I'm like, I'm still interviewing. You're in interview right? mode. Right. And and they said, and I and I said something like that. Well, I mean, I, I, I'll just I power through the interview until the interview is done. They're like, oh, dude, you, you got this. The last step in this process, though, is a group of us want to meet with you to make sure that you're the type of person that we, we want to sit in a car with for eight hours. Because a lot of times that's what the job comes down to, right? You're in a car with someone for an extended period of time or you're you're working in close proximity uh, for an extended period of time. Mm-hmm. So at the end of the day, regardless of your background, regardless of your race, ethnicity, they want to know, are you the type of person that we want to kind of sit with and be with for a long period of time? And I really appreciated that. And that actually also impacted me. And it's something that I've tried to replicate here in Collin County. So when we hire people, we're very fortunate. Like our, our, our vacancy rate is much lower than it is for other law enforcement agencies. So we can afford to be more selective in who we hire. But we want to make sure that not only are we hiring people that pass the background and are, are, are you know, good citizens and don't have criminal histories and all this kind of stuff. We want to we, we want to hire people that are good people. Right. Because at the end of the day, uh, that's who we want to work with. Well, yeah. And it's it's the, the whole thing. It's the airport test. Do <laughs> I want to do I want to have to be stuck at a four hour layover with you? Are you going to be boring and just like talk about the same stuff and just be annoying to be around right. or are you going to be someone that, you know, we can sit there and we can people watch and right. we could just, you know, just have at least a halfway decent time right. that, you know, we know we're going to be here for a while. Right. And I mean, that, that makes total sense to me. I, I think a lot of, I mean, I obviously work in tech and, and we have our own hiring process, but I think that's a bias that I don't think should go away. I right. think you should look to hire people that um, you can get along with. That doesn't mean that they should be the same race, they should think like you, they should be from the same background. None of that. Right. It's more just, are you able to have a conversation? Are you able to argue with them? Right. That I think is hugely important. Right. Can you guys disagree right. and then still be able to say, hey, like, I don't agree with your process, but we'll give it a try. Right. 
We'll just that, test it out. That, that speaks to my heart. Cause like I said, my dad worked for the state department. So when we were growing up, he, uh, he was you know, PC before PC was even a thing. Right. So we were, <laughs> but when we were growing up, he's a diplomat, he, right? He was. And so he, but he talked about how you should never raise your voice. You know, you should never have to yell at someone, curse at them. Uh, and it's how you resolve problems that really, uh, determines the type of person you are. I mean, can you sit down at a table like this and have a, a conversation with someone in a way where you express your opinion, you listen to theirs, and then you come to a resolution in a way that leaves that person feeling like, okay, this that was a good experience, regardless mm-hmm. of the outcome. Right? Yeah. Um, it's like that Maya Angelou quote, like people forget what you said, people forget what you did, but they won't forget how you made them feel, right? 100%. Um, and so that uh, has you know, also impacted you know, me and the type of person yeah. I, I grew up to be. Thanks, man. This this more or less concludes part one, just because I really wanted to get an understanding of the Academy itself, that process. Um, just for everybody tuning in for part two, it's going to get a little bit different because I, I don't know. I think we've all watched Narcos on Netflix. That's, you know, step number one. But like, I've always been interested by organized crime and all of that stuff. And obviously, um, Narcos, the primary mode for everything and that got everything going was the drugs and and you know during the reagan administration the the war on drugs and everything else and so i want to dive into a little bit of that and get an understanding of there's a recent um on july 15th there was a uh re-arrest of um a kingpin that more or less is responsible for um the sinaloa cartel the juarez cartel um, and the Tijuana cartel. Um, he's like one of the godfathers in Mexico of, you know, what we know as, you know, the drug trade today. Right. Um, and he was recaptured on July 15th, but he was also actually a part of something in 1985 that basically got the DEA even more involved in Mexico in the drug trade. And that was actually the assassination of um, Kiki Camarena. He was a DEA agent and he was picked up and he was tortured and then he was assassinated and it wasn't just by um these two guys that were you know starting up their own cartel there were also corrupt cops involved like there was it was a it was a big deal and so i want to have a conversation about that because i feel like that's also just currently relevant right um so tune in in part two for that particular conversation matt thank you so much for coming out Appreciate, Appreciate it, that. Um, and then we'll see you guys in part two. I did notice that this time when I got asked back, you gave me ice in the water. The first time I was here, uh, I just got the water. The first time? You mean 15 minutes ago? Uh, that's the first time to me. <laughs> that is. <laughs> <laughs> and now I get ice. So I get, you get, you gave yourself ice. So maybe next time I'll get Diet Coke if I get invited back again. And if there's, honestly, I don't think we have any like sodas in this house. <laughs> So maybe I'll bring my own. No, I, I should have. I usually ask. I'm like, hey, like, what do you what do you want to drink during an episode? And for whatever reason, I just didn't ask you. Right. Well, I, I thought we were going to have a beer. I'll be honest. But I forgot that you were doing another thing after this. This is the first time I've ever done something like this. I was kind of expecting like the green room treatment where I get, like, <laughs> like yellow M&Ms only. I only eat yellow M&Ms. You know. You've got a rider in there. <laughs> cinnamon Teddy Grahams. So the only Teddy Grahams I'll eat. Cinnamon awesome. Teddy Grahams. <laughs> If I come back, I want cinnamon Teddy Graham for Diet Coke. I'll, I'll d- we'll make sure it's a part of the text right. conversation. <laughs> that way we have those ready in a clear bowl. That's right. That's if right. if to... it's if it's a red bowl right. or I can't actually see them through it, it doesn't count. I'm I'll, fucking leaving. I'll have a taster first. I'll have the person taste it for me. Make sure it's good. Bring your, you bring your younger brother. <laughs> I would, that would, would be hilarious. It would be funny, except he would take over and he would say things about me on air that would uh, T- not... I would not I was, like to hear. We'd end up like devolving into like a straight because you always oh, go back. Dude. You go back to how you were when you were ten, hundred percent, right? Yeah. So we would just end up on the floor rolling around, and you, it wouldn't yeah, be much of I would thing. honestly just like push both of you out in the hallway and shut the door <laughs> and be like, "This equipment is not getting damaged by you two hooligans." That's how our parents treated us. So that's yeah, perfect. That's no, we're that's used to that. yeah. You guys, I got it. I'll, I'll be like a way younger version of your dad. <laughs> I've got the same degree. I feel like that's, it aligns. It makes that's sense. True. And you guys have had similar experiences too. You know, you lived you lived outside the U.S. and stuff, yeah. and so that gives you a different perspective. You know, oh for sure. I mean, it's such a. That's why I'm like really like happy for my brother. Like, but is that how you genuinely. learn to talk to people the way you do? Like, you're very easy to talk to. <sighs> my, so I did this really weird thing. So whenever I was moving schools, uh-huh. um, I would try on a new personality, like a person tries on an outfit. Right. And so I moved three different elementary schools, two different middle schools, two different high schools, and two different colleges. So every time I moved, 
I just I didn't know who I was because I was this kid that was stuck between two worlds. Right. I was also someone that like I grew up in the '90s, so like you kind of have you have to be something. You have right. to be some sort of archetype. Right. That's your identity. Right. And you're I an was athlete or an artist. It, or you're this you're exactly. And I was this like short, fat, nerdy kid for a long time, and I was just smarter than other kids. So that was my <laughs> that was my role was right. to be the witty, shitty kid. Right. And. I didn't really feel smart. I just like got my stuff done and I came home and I read books. I right. hated going outside. And so every time I moved, I'd try on a new personality type. And eventually in college, um, freshman year college, UT Tyler, I was like, I really don't like this version of my, like these right. aspects. Cause I, I'd become, I was bullied as a kid and then I became a bully and I bullied other kids. And it was very much a full circle sort of thing. And in college, um, no wonder you looked at me kind of funny when the last episode I talked about, you said, well, did they let bullies in law enforcement? I said, no, we try to do a good job of weeding those type of people out. And I noticed your eyes kind of got a little bit bigger then. Well, no, no, it makes, I mean, it makes sense. But I think a lot of people also, like I have a friend of mine who was on last night for the podcast and like, he's, he's usually never had good experiences with law enforcement, right. even though he's extremely well-spoken, pretty respectful guy, but like his experiences, and I think it's the whole small town thing. Right. Um, but he also told me like, Plano PD, Dallas PD, like he's seen those interactions there as right. well. And it's like, I, I get if someone's jaded in that way because they haven't had a good experience. Whereas right. for me, I'm because of my personality, I say outlandish things all the time. Right. And then it doesn't stop if a cop stops me. I just say something outlandish and I hope they laugh. Right. Because like my brother was next to me whenever I told you that story about uh, when I got pulled over my mom's car. Right. And he goes, what's wrong with you? Right. Like anybody else is like, dude, what the... That's a cop. And I'm like, right. yeah, he's a cop. He's like three years older than me. Right. Like he's he's some guy that probably goes and gets a beer after this. It's fucking fine. Right. It gets back to your whole, the whole reason behind this pot. We're all people, right? Going through this life together. For example, you talk about how your different experiences have influenced the type of person you are and how, how you came to be, mm -hmm. even though it was through adopting these different personalities and trying these different things yeah. onto, in this search where you ultimately found out who you were. Growing up the son of a foreign service diplomat, we we moved every two years, right? And so you see a lot of these foreign service brats or military brats that move every couple of years, most of whom are just like average people like I am. You learn how to make friends pretty quickly. You have to. Um, yeah, and you learn, but then you have, there's a certain percentage that just doesn't seem to ever be able to click and then they just kind of become different types of people. So I have two younger brothers, mm -hmm. one of whom is just like me, just average guy like me uh, makes friends easily i love that you're like I, I used to be a dea agent just your average guy no big deal i ran a guy's campaign average guy but then my brother dave, my brother dave was like man i wish we just lived in the same small town forever and knew the same people forever yeah. so i get to high school mm -hmm. and i'm you know playing basketball um, How was, tall are I was, you? I was in the chat. I'm I'm still six feet tall, but I'm, I was a good basketball player. <laughs> so. Uh, I don't know where you're going with that, Daniel. But Steve so, Nash. So, Steve so Nash. I played. Uh, <laughs> man, he was uh, actually uh, in my generation. Was Steve Kerr was mm. like the idol, right? So, um, but I'm, I'm on the basketball team. I'm, I'm in the chess club also, and I'm in the Spanish club, right? Because I, Jeez. you know, the Spanish, but I, and I was fine. Like I, I, I loved each one of those groups, mm -hmm. right? But each, the other groups made fun of the people in the, the, the group yeah. that I was in, right? So the athletes, for example, would make fun of me when I showed up around them. They'd make fun of me. Oh, you're the chess, just board. the chess club, right? <laughs> the Spanish club. The Spanish club people would be like, oh, you're just going with the chess people or something like that. I'm like, hey, who cares? But I didn't, you know, yeah. distinguish between any of these groups. They were all, and I liked hanging around with each one of those different groups of people just, and I, I was totally comfortable in my own skin. Like I didn't think anything about it, right? And stuff, so I, I think- I wasn't, but I got there eventually. Mm -hmm. um, Cause it was like, uh, I was definitely in a, a bunch of different groups, but the same the same thing always like got me in trouble, which was me talking. Um, I, I got I got phone calls home even senior year of high school mm -hmm. from my Spanish teacher being like, "Hey, can you just have a sit down with Daniel and just please please just talk to him? He's distracting <laughs> other kids. Like he right. finishes his work and then he gets bored and he's distracting other people and they're not learning. Like right. their their grades are actually suffering because of him. Right. And I was like. That's not. Well, you were my a smart fault. kid. You're finishing your work quickly. I was lazy, dude. It was. It was I could. I could have definitely gone to like Spanish AP or something. But I was like, that seems too hard. In case your parents were watching, I was trying to put a positive spin. Nah, they know. They know what I am. Not even who I am. They know what I am. Okay. Was <laughs> They're your, fine with was it. Was your brother the same way? My my brother, like everybody loved my brother. Uh -huh. Like my brother had a cheering section in middle school in soccer, not just from the students, but from the teachers. Like they blew up his face right. and made it into like a cheering sign. So like he like is interesting in that 
I, I feel like I'm definitely the more extroverted one okay. and I'm definitely the person that's able to talk to anybody, but I also initiate all the time. Right. Whereas for him, it's the other way around, whereas like other people initiate, but he also he's magnetic in that way that a lot of people like him. Like right. anyone that's talked to him has a positive thing to say. Whereas I'd right. say it's 50, 50 on me. Like you can flip a coin and somebody be like, Oh, that guy's an asshole. Right. Or they're like, Oh, he's actually really cool. Well, I think your friend, Eric, who I met <laughs> earlier, um, I think he used to like you until you wrote him out of the show. Right. I mean, cause he's not yeah. part of the, podcast well before, he's no? still a part of the podcast for season two and season three he just he's got other things going on well like i was saying to you guys earlier out there i thought i was looking forward to seeing him because i'd watched a couple of your episodes and i, yeah, I yeah, realized yeah. he was like the voice behind the screen right that didn't appear on camera and stuff or like he'll like make faces because usually like where his position is is like directly behind the guest right and so he'll like nod to the mic Right. For me, for me to like adjust the guest or something like that. And so uh, a lot of a lot of those like things that I end up doing throughout or like even like that we have like off camera, like uh -huh. it'll be like him waving something or like giving me like the time signal. So like right. now I don't I, I do everything by feel right. more than anything. So like I'll check. Of, you're kind of rudderless, though, without Eric. Is what the sense <laughs> um, I hope not, because uh, if that's the case. Shit. <laughs> um, but I think I think actually we're in a pretty good spot. Last night was um, of of the season. Um, it was a very emotional episode, but it was one of my favorites because of it. Huh. Uh, we talked uh, with a buddy of mine, Josh. Um, his mom went through a difficult journey with just her health and cancer and everything else. And oh, wow. unfortunately, she's no longer with us. Yeah. And this is going to be the 10 years. But he also himself had um, a similar journey. That's actually, we're talking to him again tomorrow to oh, talk wow. about his experience with it. Huh. So actually I'm talking, that's, you two are like the reason that like I, I brought the studio up is like to right. have these conversations. And so we're like just staggering you guys. Right. Cause I couldn't have those conversations with them back to back nights. Yeah, be, Cause like they were heavy yeah, conversations. That's hard. Like, yeah. And well, I mean, sorry for your friend. Yeah. I mean, I meet me too, man. Like he, he's, he's a good dude. And like, it's just, he's, he's, handling it better than most people ever could because sometimes you get, you know, dealt that hand. Mm -hmm. and you just you just don't know how to handle it um going back to our conversation in regards to da and everything else like i know your dad was um, a foreign service officer fso that's actually something that i looked at which is kind of how we um, bonded even more right. um but who gets those foreign foreign office assignments in the dea is it a fresh grad? Is it someone that's got tenure? How are, how did those get assigned? Typically, they're people that have tenure. I mean, you have to have, have worked in an office for a period of time. Now, there are people who hire on. Like, there was one person in my basic agent training class that spoke um, a, a language. I want to say, like, maybe Mandarin Chinese or okay. something like that. And I'm pretty sure he went straight overseas after getting out of Quantico. But typically, those assignments are go to more seasoned, uh, experienced uh, agents and stuff. After you've gone to your initial office, the, the office that they assign you to, mm -hmm. and then uh, eventually you put in for a transfer like that and and do that. The My first, actually my second group supervisor in Detroit actually came from Belize. He, was a, he was a DEA agent in Detroit for a while and then went to Belize for several years, then came back to Detroit as a group supervisor and then and promoted to a, a ASAC, which is the next level up, assistant special agent in charge. Okay. And then there's a special agent in charge. Um, and then, uh, but Robert actually went to DC and really rose up in the ranks of the DEA uh, organizational structure. It's interesting, yeah, it's interesting kind of who's able to actually like last in that space. Cause I feel like, that can't be easy. I mean, even looking at your dad and stuff, like marriages and stuff, like it's like hard. having to not just be a part of this person's life that like you don't know if they will or won't come back, but it's also the aspect of like you might have to like pack up, go to a brand new city where you have no infrastructure, right. no support system. And then also you might at some point, if this person speaks Spanish like you do, right. we might have to go to like Costa Rica, That's right. Guatemala, like That's right. whatever. <clears throat> so they told us shortly after we got to Quantico, they asked how many people were married. And of the 50 agents uh, that were there at the time, or basic agent trainees, as they were called, uh, about two thirds of them raised their hands, right? And they said, well, uh, within the first two years, 90% of you will be divorced because um, Jesus. you're going to have to move, you know, the, for the first time, right? When shortly after you get out of Quantico, right? You go back to your office of hire for three months, then you go to the office that they assigned you to. 
And then usually, typically, like three or four years after that, you move again, right? And and moving is hard. You know, they talk about the three biggest stressors in a person's life. It's change of jobs, change of marital status, and, and change in residency, right? So it's one of the big three right off the bat, right? And your spouse, if uh, is it working as a D agent, there aren't there aren't nine to five hours. So one of the things that became a stressor in my own relationship with my then uh, with the with the person I'm married to now, we were engaged at the time. Was you know I'd go to work on a Tuesday and come home Thursday, or you know go to work on Friday, thinking okay we've worked for two straight weeks. I'm going to be home Friday night. We're going to go hang out. We're going to do X, Y, and Z. You know, as a guy, you commit to all these things. And then, and then you, you let know, him down. I'm calling her, yeah, at six or seven o'clock at night saying, Michelle, I can't. Uh, we're stuck here and stuff. And and she's very, very understanding. But I could tell that, you know, um, it was definitely going to be something that impacted our relationship, which is why I ultimately made the decision to get out of the DEA and to get into more traditional law enforcement work like, like I'm in now because it's more of a nine to five job. And those nights when I do work, I know it, it might last two or three days in a row or a weekend, but it's going to quickly go back to being a, a more family friendly schedule and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I mean, so when you did get out in 2001, how did you already have kids or how old were they? No. So we had, we actually, um, our first was born, um, uh, we did, we got married a year after I left the DEA and then oh, a couple oh, years okay. after that, we had our son Luke who just graduated from high school. Okay. Cool. Interesting. Has he has he expressed any interest in wanting to go the law enforcement route or yeah, is he so like you know, polar so, opposite? No, so you know, so you were out there when I pulled up in my truck, you know, with the lights and sirens and stuff. And so I'm used to, you know, kids in a neighborhood or something like that, like wanting to get in and get on the yeah. microphone and talk and stuff like that on the loudspeaker, not on like the pol police radio <laughs> and stuff like that. Um but my kids have never been interested. My daughter is actually interested in going into federal law enforcement. So she wants me to tell her stories about DEA and stuff yeah. like that. But my son has no interest in it. Like he just, he he's, for a while there, he played soccer at, at uh, for FC Dallas as well. Okay. But sometimes I would go pick him up like after, uh, after work and he'd want me to stay in my car because I'm, I'm in a uniform and stuff. And, and not in a bad way. I just think he just thought, you know, I was different from a lot from other dads, you know, and we live yeah. here in Frisco. It's a, it's a pretty wealthy uh, area and most people are, are very successful in uh, the private sector and stuff. Yeah. And they're not, you know, working for the government and they're not working. Uh, they're not wearing a uniform to work. I mean, their uniform is, you know, designer jeans, maybe mm -hmm. in a nice shirt or a suit or something like that. So I look different and stuff, but I think that that's, you know, understandable. I think a lot of kids, um, look at their parents differently or they think other the parents of other kids are, are cooler and do oh, more sure. interesting things than what their own parents do you know so it's not bad and now he asks questions from time to time about things and stuff like that and we've always been close he just had no interest in going into law enforcement yeah and i mean all of that stuff like it awakens at different times i i remember um Dak Shepard, he he's had a lot of really interesting roles, but he's an actor. And his his daughter a asked him at some point in time because his wife was was the voice in Frozen. So like, oh wow, all kids know that, right? right? And daughter was like, oh, are is, is mom famous? <laughs> and he's like, yeah. Or no, right. she had first asked him. She was like, are are you famous, daddy? And he goes, yeah, yeah. I mean, I've, I've been in movies and stuff and pe people know me and like I'm going to like do this thing and right. I've got this podcast and all this stuff. And she's like, oh, is mommy famous? <laughs> and then it's like, y yeah, like and, and kids just like kids when they're younger, obviously don't right. know these things are like, you know, dad's a cop, but like it doesn't sink in until it does. That's right. But then it's also like. I mean, there's so many kids that probably like look at you and you're like, dude, dude, that's an awesome. Like, you were in the DEA. Like, what yeah. the fuck? But also, was that like? yeah, so like a lot of parents, I made some mistakes along the way, Daniel. So when when Luke, I remember distinctly, we were living in Austin at the time, and uh, I was working for the uh, Travis County District Attorney's Office as a lieutenant investigator there, and we had a. Uh, and so I wore a, a suit and tie to work every day, but I was freshly out of my DEA career, right? Mm -hmm. And so when Luke was, uh, I'm pretty sure he was five years old, he was going to a Montessori school because those mm -hmm. are the schools that I attended when I was growing up living in South America. My parents would seek out um, either o the uh, American cooperative schools or Montessori schools wherever mm -hmm. we could. And so I wanted my kids to go to Montessori school because I thought it's a good learning environment and stuff. And so, <laughs> but when Luke was five, I, I, I sat him down. Because you know they, how they do those studies where they, they uh, every year where they try to determine like, 
what at what age are kids first exposed to drugs and what age are they first exposed to whatever and at the time no those idea. those were decreasing and i saw that like kids at a younger and younger age were being exposed to drugs for the first time and, and doing things like that so i sat luke down he's five years old and i said listen i'm gonna have a conversation with you about drugs and you know he's wide-eyed and looking at me and stuff and i talked about the different ways drugs can be in, ingested right i mean there are people that will you know use a needle and ingest oh my god dad i hate shots i can't imagine it's like yeah there are people that ingest drugs that way some people snort drugs why would you snort drugs and shoot up your nose? there are some people that smoke you know drugs and stuff like that but it was all in an effort to impress upon him like don't do drugs right stay away from that stuff well you know, my wife normally dropped the kids off at this Montessori school and picked them up, whatever like that. But a week later, I go to pick them up, and this uh, in this one, the lady that ran this facility pulled me off to the side and said, and I'm not going to remember her accent, but they're sure. all Indian folks, and and they were fantastic people. But she takes me off to the side and she says, "I need to have a conversation with you. Luke is scaring the kids. <laughs> Very, you know, he's one of our best students, but he's he he's he, he's scaring the kids." And I said, how? And so she wrote up this incident report where he was basically talking about how, <laughs> you know, you can use needles to ingest, dr to in inject drugs. He's your educating. Body. She should and thank him. Like that, right. But so then, so I, and, and he was trying, I picked him up and he was like, dad, he could tell that the, the teachers were te treating him differently that day. Yeah. Because right? they were probably all whispering about things like that and trying to keep him away from the other kids or whatever like that. And so I explained to him, man, I'm sorry, Luke. I said, here's the thing. I'm just more sensitive to this type of stuff because I work in law enforcement. I want to make sure that you you know, you know, get the benefit from my experience or something mm -hmm. like that. So I think along the way, he probably thought like, man, this law enforcement stuff is getting me in trouble or you know, putting these ideas yeah, in my head yeah, and yeah, I'm yeah. saying stuff in school and getting in trouble for it and stuff. So you know, I don't know, but I, I do remember that experience he had early on because he still talks about that. That was obviously That's interesting. Enough, but yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, I mean, for a lot of kids, I think that's very positive because I've also heard some friends – you know, in the past or friends of friends where they're just like, yeah, I smoked weed for the first time when I was 13. And I was like, right. I can't wrap my head around that. Right. Like at the age of 13, I was barely, you know, figuring out what football was and right. this and that. And so it's just like those life experiences. Like, I feel like if, if, if someone, you know, had sat down and had those conversations, I think that would, that would allow kids to at least be kids for just a smidgen right. longer. Well, see to your point too, Daniel, I mean, the biggest thing that we're experiencing now in law enforcement, cause you ask a lot of questions about the DEA specifically. So with about drug use specifically, a lot of attention has been paid in the past to meth and the dangers of meth and obviously the different ways in which drugs are coming into this country and the problems on the border mm -hmm. and stuff like that and how that's, uh, led to an increase in in, in drugs uh, being you know being brought into this brought into our country, but the biggest problem is is fentanyl and the casual transference among drugs with, with the kids. Like a kid will give a friend a an ADHD pill or something like that, yeah. right? And not knowing that that has a little bit of fentanyl in it and stuff, and that kid's like you know overdosing. It's kind of what we talked about in the last episode, where I think and then. It, it, people have an idea in their head about what a junkie looks like, right? So even when those 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 incidents are reported in the news, they'll talk about a drug overdose, right? Well, again, people have an, an idea in their head about somebody who- What's well, his generalization? A, a lot yeah. of needle marks in their arms and somebody who's probably struggled for years, not thinking that it's that 16-year-old kid that that lives in a, in, a, in a middle to upper class family that took a friend's pill and that was laced with fentanyl, unbeknownst to the friend and that- and the kid that ingested it and then died, right? Well, I mean, it, it could it could be somebody like it, it. It doesn't even have to be like in the middle class arena. It's like right. it, you you could be doing drugs that you have done for a long time that, right. that have been quote unquote safe ish, I guess right. for for that environment. But like I saw I saw a graph. This was three days ago, I think two days ago. Um, but it was it was showing the deaths from cocaine and heroin and just like for the longest time like heroin deaths were like the top right and then you literally just see it and you see fentanyl at the bottom right and it's there it's been there like for you know a long time and all of a sudden you just see it in the last like what like seven eight years that's right the deaths just literally it literally goes like everything else is like slowly going up and it's not like exponential but it's it's increasing significantly right. it's not linear but then you just see fentanyl go to here and just hua. Right. So what we found out from interviewing people who are arrested that have ties to the cartel and, and stuff like that, they're they're purposefully lacing drugs with fentanyl because they know the addictive uh, 
aspects of that, right? And it's to get people hooked on it and stuff. And so, uh, and they've actually said, there have been reports where some have said to law enforcement personnel, and if a few more Americans die, I mean, so be it. Because one one law enforcement person that I know who questioned someone at a jail here nearby said, you know, if, if, if that's just a kind of a byproduct of doing business now. So if a few Americans die, because because the, the law enforcement person said, but you're, you're killing your, your customer right, yeah. by doing that. Well, but you, you understand we're, we're getting so many more people hooked by introducing fentanyl to drugs that it's the profit market. The cost so of doing greater. business. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we're winning in the end. Right. So you're exactly right though. It's not just people who are from middle class and upper class families that are taking pills and, and dying, but it's people who have used drugs for long periods of times, regardless of their socioeconomic uh, status that we see dying from fentanyl. And so what we're trying to do is, is get the word out that, and trying to, and we're working with the governor's office and other people to try to develop different, you know, PR campaigns to talk about what's really going on out there and stuff to try to, to hopefully prevent people from experiencing these horrible uh, situations. Yeah, you and Sheriff Skinner mentioned that you guys are kind of trying to get the verbiage out there that it's not necessarily, I mean, yes, it is a drug overdose, but at the same time that you guys wanted to mention that it was more uh, fentanyl poisoning, just That's because right. of like the increase of of how frequently fentanyl is used more than you know in the past. I appreciate that you actually remember that, Daniel, because one of the things I was going to specifically use is that's the phrase that we're trying. We're, we're, we're mm -hmm. using ourselves more. We're trying to get the media to use more. We're trying to get other people to use more. Is these are fentanyl poisonings? They're not, they're not drug overdoses. Uh, I mean, they technically are still. I mean, the drugs are a part of it, right? Like, but not in the traditional sense. These aren't drug overdoses in the traditional sense. I mean, occasionally what you'd experience, what I experienced with the DEA, actually, is you'd get a really um, sh high strain of heroin that would come into a, an area and you'd get these heroin overdoses, right? Because could, could, do, do you overdose from like a pure pure heroin or just stuff that's like mixed and laced and you cut can, and stuff? It, it can be both, but typically what happens is you get a strain that's too pure. In other words, they didn't introduce enough cutting agents in there and stuff. And so you get people dying. But in some, t in some of those situations, what was happening is those heroin dealers were intentionally putting out a more pure strain, trying to get people hooked, right? Not realizing they put too pure of a strain out there and people were dying. So that was one of the things that even when I work with the DEA, you get like in a place like Detroit, which was kind of hard to judge because at the time I lived in Detroit for a few years there, it was the murder capital of the world, of, of, of the U.S., right? Yeah. Maybe the world too, but it was definitely the murder capital of the U.S. And so there were, you know, eight to 10 to 12 people dying a day. And that's insane. So it's hard to pick up on patterns like that because the, there are so many people dying, but, but, um, and, and through by being killed by others or drug overdoses and stuff like that. But, we there were several times when we got pulled off of the cases we were working and told we've got to go in and investigate this this one particular area because they've had a, a rash of deaths in a real short period of time and we needed to kind of figure out what was going on. We, I mean, yeah, you had to contain the deaths at that point in time, and yeah, that's so that's insane. Right. But the science behind this stuff is incredible, Daniel, because we would actually have these uh, things from time to time. We would get by heroin. <clears throat> And send them off to the DEA labs, and they can tell the exact hillside of the country <laughs> where that heroin, that strain came from and stuff, um, which was just really kind of remarkable, which yeah. is appealing because I know that's your kind of your background. You're a smart guy. Um, I'm the typical average. I love that you said that's that's appealing to you. Heroin. That's no, appealing no, no, to you. No, no, because you're intelligent, because <laughs> you're a smart guy. The science aspect, it was me. I'm just a typical average cop that's not that bright. And so I was like, oh, okay, this is like where this stuff is kind of, it's kind of cool, but I didn't understand all the science behind it and stuff. So, I mean, dude, I'll be honest with you. You remember those, um, the the tax tests, the, the placement oh, yeah. tests? I barely, barely passed the science one. I don't believe that. Uh, no, that's a fact. I passed it with a 70. I, I passed all the other ones um, reading, math, all that stuff, like right. 98, 100, like just whatever. Huh. But the science one, for whatever reason, right. could not do it. Love biology though. So like biology, chemistry, I can do those. Physics is fun. I got to make a catapult. That was uh, in college. Dude, okay. if I knew that I could take physics and then make weapons from it, I would have graduated like with a degree in physics. I just didn't know how that worked. And also, if anybody told me that I could be a gunsmith, right. I wouldn't have gone to college. Huh. I would have gone and done that. That seems amazing. I've still looked into it. Even even now, like even working like in tech, I'm just like, so how many years is it to apprentice for that? Like, that seems really cool. Right. Like, just, just interesting. So are you thinking about actually doing that for real? I, 
I don't know. I I don't I don't think so. But like, huh. I wouldn't be surprised if one day I woke up and was like, "Fuck it, right? I'm just dropping everything and I'm gonna go be a gunsmith." I don't know enough about guns right now. Well, so I appreciate you saying that because what I was about to say is, you know, I think again, my idea of most people in law enforcement was that they they grew up shooting guns and, you know, did all this kind of stuff. I remember when I got to Quantico, 27 years old, the instructor said, how many of y'all have never shot a gun before? And I'm sitting in the front row. I, I raised my hand. And I'm like, okay, three of you. And I'm looking around like, man, there's 47 out of the 50 that are like, man, like what, what the heck's going on? Um, but I still to this day am not a gun nut. Like a lot of law enforcement people when they get together, they're talking about different rifles and ammo types and stuff like that. I can I, I can talk about those things in generalities, but I'm not, you know, you give me some strange model weapon and I can't take it a break it down to its basic components and reassemble it quickly like most people I work with can. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I respect that and stuff. It's just not something that I I'm just not a gun nut. You know, I know how to use mine and, yeah. and but that's and how to properly you know, safeguard it and clean it and take care of it and stuff like that. But I'm not, I'm not a gun nut. So if you go in and become a gunsmith, I'll learn with you as you go. Oh dude. Yeah. I, I, I mean, it's, it's definitely up there for things because I find, I don't know why I, I think it's because I grew up in a war zone and it's like not supposed to be something that I enjoy. Right. And I think it's because of the, that, that, that reverse psychology piece of I'm not supposed to like it. Right. I absorb <clears throat> books, movies, l any sort of literature on wars, history of war. Um, my elective classes weren't like anything that anyone would consider fun. I went and took ancient civ to better understand how, uh, how, those earlier societies, how married they were to war and how that was intertwined with their societies. That's cool. Like to understand what the actual warlike culture was and why it evolved the way that it did and how it did. And so right. it got to the point where I was teaching other ancient Civ major students. Uh -huh. I was tutoring them in their own major, even though I was a business student. Wow. Because like, I, I love the subject. The subject wow. to me is just so interesting. Right. Um, and that was another thing that I probably should have done is just like, Screw the business degree. I should have just gotten an ancient civ or like history degree and had a great time. But yeah, but then you would have been like a professor or something, probably. Right? No, I probably would have done exactly all the same stuff that I did now. I got a business degree and did nothing with it, still today. And it's been what? What year? Been twenty two. So it's been like six years. No, eight years. I haven't done shit with it. Hmm. I'm I'm in tech and like the degree that I have, have like plays no role in recruiting at all. It's, I don't know, man. This yeah, entire thing is, is odd. That's why uh, you need Eric, though. Eric helps you with that stuff. Eric never went to college. He didn't? Never. But yet you lean on him for all the tech stuff, though, right? So? There's <laughs> plenty of brilliant people that never went to school. Like my Both my parents run um, run their own businesses. Uh -huh. Didn't go to school. My grandma, my mom, told me this the other day. She, uh, I think she had three days of school. One of the smartest women I know. Like she's like sh just straight up wise. Um, also really hilarious because she'll say in front of all the grandkids that I'm her favorite, which people shouldn't do, but it is right. hilarious when it happens. But does she tell the other grandkids the same thing though? No. Oh, she okay. says it in front of them that I'm her favorite. So that's, wow. So like it's like announced. Um, she's like, yeah, no, you guys are all great. I love everybody equally, but he's first. Sorry. Are you the oldest? I'm the oldest grandchild on both sides. Yeah. Okay. That may, okay. Yeah. So has that caused others to want to fight you or anything? Does it cause some they animosity? Should, oh God, that'd be funny. I, I have. But you got your bad wrist. You can't really fight. I back. I don't I don't need my hands. <laughs> like I I well, would I catapults. would welcome I would welcome them. You got your catapults you can build, and then you know if they come after you, you dude. Can... I've at this point in time, I think I've broken like three or four noses just with my head. I'm not even worried. Right. I'm I'm like a wrecking ball of a human being. There's like a. It was all overseas. Okay, it's fine. I, saying, I was thinking like statute of limitations, possible criminal offenses and stuff like that. So it's, it's, I, I, what's, what's the statute of limitations? How many years is it? I, I don't, let's. You're, 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 you're a police officer. You should know this. Yeah, no, I do know this, <laughs> but I, I want to talk about something else because I don't want this to dive all, the end. With ah, that is fair. You off that is fair. You, we are, we are, <laughs> jump, j the jumping off point's very different. Um, so obviously seeing the fentanyl, um, being in the DEA, seeing just how many different um, organizations exist out there that are, one, helping produce, 
to transporting and then getting it into different arenas, not just the US, but like literally these organizations are getting it into other arenas, into places where a lot of tourists go, you know, right. it's, it's literally everywhere. And it's right. not just looking at, you know, um, Central and South America, it's also looking at Asia, it's also looking at um, the Middle East, Europe, all these places, knowing that all of this is out there, does it ever just feel like too much? Does Do your efforts feel wasted? So there were times, in all honesty, um, probably every DEA agent experiences this, where you feel like, you know, the, the, the drug war's over and we lost. You know, I mean, because there's just, the quantity is just coming in. And they're, they're, and you can look on, on online, I'm sure, to this day, but when I hired on in 1997, I remember there was, shortly before then, there was, a, there was an infamous interview given by a, a SAC, a special agent in charge of a, of, of a large office, said so we made a significant dent in the drug war and they'd seized, you know, several hundreds of kilos off of a submarine or something like that or whatever. And then, the you know, the next day you realize that that didn't, wasn't even a drop in the bucket, just given the quantity of drugs that are coming in this country. So it's hard, especially because like I lived in Detroit or I worked in Detroit which is a dead end city when it comes in terms of like drugs coming in from the South, right? There'll be different distribution points along the way, Dallas and then Iowa and then Kentucky. And then eventually like the last load is dropped off in Detroit, right? And so you'd think well, if we're really gonna fight this drug war, why don't they put us all on the borders and fight the drugs where they are coming into this country or better than that, why don't we go to these countries where these drugs are being produced and burn these coca fields and stuff like that, you know, work with these governments to try to do that. And that's part of the effort that we're trying that 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 goes on, regardless of the administration, Republicans, Democrats, as you try to work with these countries to try to to address the the drugs that are coming in, but it's it's basic economics, it's a supply and demand. And so then you realize um, cause another thing that is a typically in law enforcement, you know, we, we want more guns, we want more equipment. We want to keep fighting this battle, whatever it is we're in. So with the DEA, you know, you want to, let's hire more people, you know, let's spend more money on salaries and let's get more stuff and fight this thing. But then the longer you're in it, you realize the better thing to do would be to spend money on de what's called demand reduction, right? So on treatment facilities and stuff and getting people kicked off of stuff, get them to, to, so more education. Or no, just to beat their drug habit so they're not buying as much stuff so there isn't the same demand in this country. Because as long as there's a, the demand that, that exists here, the drugs will find their way in. So another thing that a lot of DEA agents think about, my partner Mike and I would talk about from time to time, we think we would say, man, we ought to just have like a <clears throat> something like a 7-Eleven where you have like a bunch of rooms just set up and people would come in with a card or something like that and, and say, I'm here to get my daily allotment of heroin or cocaine or whatever it is and just use it there at the facility and then a couple two or three hours later when they kind of came off their high or however long it was then they would kind of leave but that way we could safeguard people make sure that they were okay and that they weren't going off and committing some criminal act while they were high or stoned or whatever you know what i'm saying so then you, you think about things like that but uh, all the while you're you're still fighting your drug war um and i remember at the time too in detroit um I think it was 95% of the ecstasy that was coming into the country was coming in over the Ambassador Bridge or through the tunnel there into Detroit. It was controlled by the Russian mafia. It was coming in that way. And so I thought, well, we ought to just turn the whole Detroit field division into just combating like ecstasy. But at the time, I mean, people aren't, you know, killing each other over ecstasy. You know, ecstasy is a drug that's used by typically wealthier kids and that can spend 50 bucks on a pill and go to a rave and be stoned out of their mind for 24 or 48 hours. Whereas, kids are literally killing each other in the streets over $20 rocks of cocaine and stuff. So obviously we, we need to keep our focus on those, uh, uh, on, on those areas that are leading to death and violence and stuff like that. But, um, but yeah, there's definitely a sense like there is probably in any industry, you know, you get frustrated when you don't feel like you're making as much of a difference as you want to make or that, um, problems are still occurring routinely, uh, and, and maybe that's something that in law enforcement you see, you know, more of like even in local law enforcement, you know, you get called out to that same house you've been to multiple times, you know, and it's tough to go back with the same energy because, you know, the couple that's fighting or, you know, the issues and you kind of go out there. And one of the things we talk about routinely in our office is we treat every call for service as if we're going to the home of a family member. Right. So treat like you're going to the home of, a, of, of your mother. How would you want your mother treated? How would you want your father, your brother, your sister treated? And with that we extend that at, the, at a sheriff's office, as you know, because you and I have talked about this, Daniel. I mean, we've got a jail that has, on average, about a thousand inmates a day, and and we 
extend that attitude we have in patrol to our jail. We want to make sure jail is a safe place for everyone, right? We treat every inmate as though they're a family member of ours and stuff. And I know one of the people that you're going to talk to here soon is a captain uh, that I recognized. Yeah, it, It's a fantastic David. story. If I could talk about it just for a second here, it's the type of thing that that we um, look for and we look to highlight. Because typically what you, what you see in recognition ceremonies when it comes to law enforcement people is you see people being recognized for what I call single acts of bravery, right? They get, they're getting a life-saving award or they're getting an award for thwarting some crime or performing some heroic act, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a one-off versus a behavior. That's right. But it's, a, and there's no, and, and those are situations that you, it's kind of a right time, right place type thing, right? And we all hope that when we're encountered with situations like that, that we all rise to the occasion and, and perform as we're expected to do, right? Um, but when it comes to being kind towards others and showing generosity, those are opportunities that are available to us every day, right? So we had a, you know, uh, we had a detention captain, like we have a lot of personnel over there, but this one detention captain um, befriended a young lady, and I won't go mm-hmm. into too many details. Yeah, he's actually going to talk about it whenever we talk on Saturday. Yeah, he's, so. he's, um, he's a remarkable guy, but he, he befriended this young lady that... Uh, was a junior who um, got in trouble, found herself in the county jail, and uh, David f- uh, befriended her, went and talked to her, and she quickly, after just being in our jail for a couple of days, developed the reputation of being a difficult in and- mm-hmm. She was fight combative, verbally abusive at times and stuff, and so he he took an, he took her aside and said, "Hey, you know what, what what's going on? How can I help you? Let's let's." start a dialogue and he started talking to her or whatever. And so he ended up like actually working with MISD McKinney independent school district officials, uh, through the juvenile justice Asso- uh, education program to get her, uh, reassimilated kind of back into the educational system, even while she was incarcerated and he was going and picking up her homework, yeah. taking it to her on a weekly basis. She was doing her, her coursework to get her back on track uh, over, to graduate over the course of several months and to where the day before she was released from our facility after about eight months, I think seven or eight months, she grad, she did enough coursework to graduate the 11th grade. And then, uh, unbeknownst to Dave, he, he gets, he goes and visits with her the day before she gets out to, to share in that, you know, experience with her and says, next time I see you better be at your high school graduation. Well, life goes on. I'm not <laughs> saying he forgets about her. He still remembered her and stuff, but you know, you get caught up in things and all of a sudden a year later, her mom calls inviting him to her graduation and stuff. And so, um, I wrote David up for the sheriff's achievement medal because that's the type of behavior that, um, we want to recognize and we want replicated and stuff. The only way to do that is to reward people in a public way like that. So others see, Oh, wow, this, you know, those are the types of deeds that are getting rewarded and stuff like that. So, um, and you and I have talked enough that it's just kind of speaks to my heart because it's really just, we're all just people going through, I think, one of the only reasons, I, clearly, I have a face for radio, as they say. I think the only, one of the only reasons you invited me on the show <laughs> isn't because I'm going to help with your ratings at all, but it's because I'm going to talk about how I am attracted to that shared commonality that of experiences we all have. And I learned from yeah. growing up in South America, it doesn't matter the color of your skin, your race, your ethnicity, your sexual preference. We all have a certain shared experience we're all going through. We all know we all had a first crush, right? We all know what it was uh, like to get cut from a sports team or from a group or something like that. Or just, yeah, just to be alienated in some way. Right. And so we have, and, and, and just because some of us have gone into careers in law enforcement, again, and we might be wearing a uniform, Although, like when I worked for the DEA, I was wearing jeans and a T-shirt, a nicer T-shirt than you're wearing. But I, I mean, not. hey, this is my brother's T-shirt, so you can make fun of him all you want. <laughs> but I was, you know, regardless of, but we're still human beings inside those uniforms and stuff, and so, and and that's important that we we remember that because I have seen over the course of my career there are people who get into law enforcement that. You know, those those type A personalities that, you know, want to exert themselves at all times and have that command presence and stuff. And and for me, those that that wasn't a real successful route. I was able to connect with people just by always being the same person I was before I got into law enforcement. I was gonna say, did you did you see anybody forget the fact that they're a person and take on just that. the identity of I'm a cop, you better fucking listen to me? Like you, you do see that. And and I've never had a problem, to be honest with you. Um I've always been comfortable with my own skin, and I'm, and I'm, and, I'm, and I can be very direct with people in a in a fair, honest way because I'm I'm speaking from the heart. But yeah. whenever I see that stuff, I take people aside and just tell them that's not yeah that's not the way to be. And yeah. this is this is before I became a chief deputy or rose the ranks and became you know a, a supervisor. 
Um, cause I just don't think that's the way people should be treated. And it doesn't matter that the person you're talking to is a, is a defendant or somebody that you suspect of a crime, that person is still a person. And it doesn't even matter if they've committed some terrible act. Cause the other thing I've seen is I've seen really good people make really bad decisions. And that doesn't change the fact that there's still really good people that made a bad decision that day. And, uh, uh, they still need to be treated with respect and with courtesy and, um, you know, and even, you know, you and I have talked offline a little bit about um, situations that we've all seen that have made the news that are horrific, like the George Floyd situation and stuff where uh, you see law enforcement personnel do things that no one trains. Um, and uh, we've seen the effects of that. And th- those are people I have no problem saying, you know, that right there is 100 percent wrong and should never have happened. Do we, and, do we have unions here, like in Texas? Do we have, because I know that like East Coast has some of that, but do we have that here in Texas? So we don't, we have uh, we have civil service here in Texas. And so there are some law enforcement folks who have, well, there are some, uh, I'm saying here from, from the sheriff's office perspective, sure. uh, there are law enforcement uh, uh, police departments that have associations and stuff that are different from that. But um, I, I think I get where you're going though, that there are those unions that might maybe protect uh folks when they, they find themselves in situations like that? that that's the thing that like i it, it i have a hard time wrapping my head around because like you so do you're I. supposed to be the person that 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 knows right from wrong to the point where you're you're protecting the citizens right. and when you get to that position where you're no longer doing that and then right. you get a mulligan all of a sudden that's right that seems a little weird because a lot of other people aren't getting that mulligan. So like the special treatment aspect, like that just, I don't know, it leaves a bad taste in a lot of people's mouth. No, I I get it. And it's, um, it's deserved quite frankly. I mean, there's no excuse for some of these things that we've seen. Um, no one trains that way. Uh, it's obvious that there are, uh, some people though that have, have, have done things and, and maybe, not say gotten away with it, but have become used to doing things. And so ultimately it's resulted in them taking an act against someone that resulted in a death that made it rise to this level and stuff. But, um, and the, the unfortunate thing is that's what makes the national news, right? And it point, paints all of us in the same light. Um, despite the fact that I think percentage wise, we probably have the same percentage of bad apples that exist in, 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 in any profession. Um, and, uh, but those people definitely shouldn't be working in law enforcement. And I think most people who work in law enforcement feel the same way I do. Um, including those who maybe are members of unions that have to take a, a stance as a union and try to explain away behavior like that or do other things more proactively to help an officer or a deputy when they find themselves in a situation like that. But that's, um, those are those are unfortunate, and I think th- I think we still are suffering from that. I mean, I think that we still, when incidents occur, I think people um, rightfully, you know, want to protest and and raise those issues uh, so that they're addressed and to make sure that people are doing the right thing. And and look, this is a free country; people have the right to free speech and and to to assemble and to. Uh, and so I don't have any problem with people doing that. We've had protests on a, in the Cullen County Courthouse about different things. We've had protests at the jail about different things that have happened and stuff like that. And there are some people uh, that you know don't like stuff like that, or they think like, "Man, this is this is not really fair because this didn't happen that way." And I'm thinking, "Hey, wait a minute! Like, if I was on the other side, I might have the same concerns and might be taking the same action and stuff." And so, um, I'm how pre- did, sorry, go ahead. No, no. I, I was going to say, so then how does that, how does that work out? Like, um, and, and, and I mean, I'm not in this, so I don't know. I'm genuinely just asking, but how does that then affect the, if your opinion, um, of the use of like the body cams and then like right. body cam malfunctions. And then I've also heard of like other departments, like as soon as they have the body cam on, they're playing like Disney music or copyrighted music. That way, if it gets posted, like right. it, it, it can't show up anywhere on the internet. So like in those situations, do people have the right because we have, you know, the freedom of speech and freedom of action? Like, do we have the right to record that incident to just make sure that it's on the up and up or how, what does that so, look like from y'all's perspective? So to, for me, so I think anything that adds transparency to what we're doing, especially now in the, in the face in the wake of these incidents that have made the national news, I think anything that adds to the transparency of what we're doing, I welcome. Because 99.9% of encounters are not like what you see on TV, not what makes the national news. 
it's definitely not how we we do things here in Collin County. <laughs> I assure you that. But the uh, so I think I think the uh, in a global sense, anything that adds to transparency, I have no problems with somebody holding up a camera and recording me when I'm talking to them. Uh, I mean, <laughs> I, I still think there are, no, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, even during a traffic stop or yeah. during an encounter uh, with someone where they're, where they're asking me questions. And I know that there's still some folks that exist. Maybe there's a kind of that older school mentality of like, you know, Hey, wait a minute. Or you want to, you know, tell them to knock it off and stuff. And um, that's just not the society we live in today. And um, so I think um, anything that has the transparency of what's going on, um, I welcome, and I treat. I, I just assume every encounter I'm having with someone, they're recording in some way. Yeah. And but that didn't change the way I am. I'm still the same person. Yeah. I don't do anything differently. I don't talk to them any differently. And I'll say this: I think most people don't realize. Like for example, um, when when a when a police officer or a sheriff's deputy pulls you over, the vast majority of the time they have no idea who's driving because they're they're they've they've caught someone on a on a, a radar gun or something like that or they've pulled someone over for driving erratically they have no idea who's who's at the wheel they don't know if it's a man or a woman they don't know the, their race ethnicity they don't know anything about them until they roll the window down i actually had a guy that i worked with I actually was a he and i he was in the class behind mine in quantico he went through basic agent training class 130 i was in 129 and uh, we ended up in Detroit together for a few years. Well, he went on and um, he traveled. He actually was one of those uh, agents that went overseas, actually, on a couple of different assignments. But he, he ended up in Dallas and retired as the ASAC of the Dallas Field Division. And he retired a few years ago. He came to work with us. And he were for a couple of years before um, going into the private sector and a whole different line of work or whatever. But mm -hmm. uh, Anthony Carter is his name. He's one of my dearest friends. And he... Um, he, uh, man, I went off on this tangent. No, no, no. Did, did, hey, you got to drive this tangent home and then I will, because I did no, but promise. He, but, he, but he would describe it this way. He okay. actually said, he, he said, it's always a surprise to me whenever I come up to the window and see who's actually driving when I pull somebody <laughs> over. Because with the DEA, you're not doing a lot of traffic stops, right? Mm -hmm. So when he gets back, he was a, he worked for the Dallas Police Department, then went and had like a 20-plus year career with the DEA, then got back into local law enforcement, like okay. with me in the sheriff's office, right? So he was, he was performing his first traffic stops in like a long time. And he said, man, it's like it's a surprise to me, like when I walk up to the window and see who it is. I, that, struck, that stuck with me because I'm thinking, yeah, it's always a surprise to me too. But so that's why, you know um, – but aren't you able to see a photo of like who owns the the car or even like if you get if you get a certain name, like there are certain biases in place where if you, you see a name or um, a could, photo or look, something. If you looked up their license plate or something beforehand, but most traffic stops, you don't. You're pulling the person over. You have no idea who it is and stuff. And so a lot of times like when someone says, well, you only pulled me over because I'm this or because I'm that. And I'll say like, I, I had no idea who I was pulling over. I, you know, I pulled you over because I was pacing you and you're driving 30 miles over the speed limit or something. But by that point, I've already said, I've, I've, I've told them who I am and why I pulled them over. And I've asked if they're okay. Cause there are occasions when someone's experiencing some type of a medical event or something yeah. like that. And in those cases, like, you know, I want to get back in the car and escort them to wherever they're going and get them to where they need to be as quickly as possible. But I just say that to say that, that, but I think I hear a lot of that too, but I think it still stems from, you know, these incidents that have made the national news. And so, you know, as a law, as a profession, we've put ourselves in that situation, and so we still have more work to do in terms of you know restoring faith and and the confidence trust. and trust in law enforcement and stuff. And so, you know, it's it, it is what it is. It's unfortunate that these these horrific events that have, have happened that should never have happened, um, but they have, and and that's you know definitely have had an impact on our society and stuff yeah. and so we still we're still you know working on i think our i mean and, and it's good to have a work in progress i mean working towards something to make it better like it, it it's unfortunate that those events happen but at least it it has unified people and having a voice to correct certain behaviors that's right that's and that's a horrible silver lining but it it's it's at least something out of, right. out, of, out of all the kind of chaos that's happened. That's right. I did promise everybody at the at the end of uh, part one that we would get into um, Kiki Camarena and like with with uh, Kintara recently getting arrested. So I am just curious, was that a part of those classes or any of that stuff? Because that happened in 85 and you guys were in there in 97. So 
Yeah. So to back up a little bit, I, I did notice how you promised that at the end of the last episode. And as I told you, when we went off air, I was thinking, man, I don't, I don't know if I have that much to say about this. <laughs> like you've committed to this great thing and I don't know if I'm going to be able to produce, but the, uh, we did. So we learned about obviously uh, uh, Kiki Camarena's situation made the national news, right? So even before I went to work for the DEA, I knew of that story, like every average person does. I think the biggest effect that that had was, um, you know, I think certain, I think the cartels realized that they went too far. You know, you killed an American federal agent. Um, that was a line that they hadn't crossed up to that point. And so there were repercussions for that. Um, you see that the, you know, it didn't lead to like other agents being killed or, the, you know, an uptick in that type of thing, uh, that type of behavior. So that was the biggest impact. But it also, um, I think that incident, and there were other incidents, that by the time I, I went through basic agent training in 1997, um, the DEA learns from experiences and, and maybe even some, uh, I shouldn't say mistakes, but just learns from experiences that other agents had, even when under operating in an undercover capacity, to do things better, right? So for us to tweak our operations and stuff and make sure that to to – in an effort to prevent situations like that from, from happening and stuff. So that was, I think the, the biggest way that incident probably impacted me was through the practicals. When I say practicals, I'm talking about those, those undercover, um, like, um, kind of, uh, operations we would practice on when we were in Quantico and stuff. And so you, you learn how to do reverses and make drug buys and take down groups and all this kind of stuff. And then, a lot of agents, when you get out of there, they're like, okay, forget everything you learned in Quantico. Now we're going to tell you how it really goes down. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, this is how it really works. They taught stuff. you the technical. We're going to teach you like how what's actually effective. Right. And so you, but you learn and, and, and those agents that came along before me learned from those experiences and stuff, because at the end of the day, whether you work in federal law enforcement or local law enforcement, the biggest thing is, you know, we want to, we want, everyone wants to go home. Right. It's kind of like yeah. we were talking about before, like the last thing you want to do, last thing any law enforcement person wants to do when they come to work is use excessive force, is pull their gun and actually have to shoot somebody. Nobody's thinking that when they go to work. I right? literally told David that. So me me and David, we had breakfast, uh, uh, I think on Sunday. And uh, I was I was talking about just like all these like recent shootings and everything that's David, been going. David Crossland? Yeah. So you had breakfast with David. I get for over like an hour, almost two hours. We sat right, down. But together. I get water with no ice, and then I get water with <laughs> ice. But you guys had breakfast. But go ahead. I'm just, this is this I'm just is trying to, this is the most passive aggressive I've ever seen a cop in my life. <laughs> I'm He's so bitter. He's I'm, so bitter, bitter about his H two O. I'm trying to hydrate you. It's hot out there. It, it's more, thank you. I You're that. welcome. I would, I would, you know, it would if I had some a breakfast or two that I'd feel even better. I'd be even more prepared. Next next time I'll I'll have I'll have early no, it'll be late lunch or early dinner. I'll okay, cook good. I'll actually cook. This is okay, I'm good. gonna make it up to you. I'll cook on Friday. Okay, I'll have a meal good. beforehand. But okay. well you're showing up at two actually, lunchtime. Yeah, there you go. Well, that, yeah, well, I, got, I got you. Good. No, no, get water no, with no. Ice you're again. you're fine. <laughs> you you look hydrated. I'm yeah. I'm really happy with this environment. So you were talking um, about you were talking about the shooting. Sorry, I got yeah, you. Yeah, no, no, no. You're fine. Um, yeah, we had breakfast. I paid for it. It was awesome. It was delicious. Man. Um, but we were we were we were talking about um a few. I mean, just just this like uptick in shootings and like for me, like I've never been a gun guy. Mm -hmm. I I've seen stuff, but I've never owned a gun. And I recently bought a gun as did my brother, because it is a little terrifying being in a situation where you're helpless, especially right. for someone that's not used to that. Right. Um, and I was like, okay, I need to get trained in this. I need to actually have one on me because this seems to be a thing that's happening way more frequently right. than it ever did in my childhood. Right. And so, um, I don't want to be in that position. Right. But like, as we saw last week, that guy that was like shooting up the mall, that's it right. wasn't cops that put that guy down. That's right. It was citizens. That's right. And that seems to be something that might be, might be a pattern for somebody, might that's be right. a pattern for me, might be a pattern for someone I know. That's right. And that sucks to be in that position. Right. I don't want to do that. And I assume other people don't either. Like you might right. be trained in, you know, doing all these things, but I don't think anybody wants to have somebody else in their fucking conscience. That's right. Well, so I think part of what I've had different citizens tell me is when they've gone through a similar experience and they've gone out and purchased a gun for the first time and they're, they're adults, 
right? And part of the part of what motivated them is the fact that they feel like everyone out there has a gun, uh, including all, you know a lot of bad. And guys. we're in Texas. Let's be honest. Well, and there's, there's a there's that aspect of things too. But they think there's so many guns out there that I don't I don't want to get involved in a situation where the bad guy has a gun and I or there's a situation that 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 I could have taken a proactive action in, but I wasn't properly equipped and stuff. And so they get these guns. I'd say that another concern that we have in law enforcement now is because there are so many guns that are out there. Like I've worked some off duty at, at churches, for example. And when I'm there in a uniform, I have several people come up to me on their way in saying, Hey, just so you know, I'm armed. Hey, just so you know, I'm armed. Yeah. yeah. Hey, so I'm armed. I'm armed. I'm armed. I'm armed. And I'm thinking, my gosh, if a bad guy stands up in here, like not only am I going to dress, but I'm also thinking like there's going to, there could potentially be some crossfire situations and stuff. And so typically what we do in those scenarios, in those situations, we try to talk to folks and explain where we are and who we are. That's why we're, we're always clearly marked you mm-hmm. know, and stuff and stuff. So, um, but no, I, I get it. I, and I think it's good. I think the only thing I encourage people to do, cause they'll ask me like, what type of class should I take? I've got a, I bought a gun and stuff like that. All I ask I'll, is that people learn how to properly secure and take care of their weapons. Uh, obviously, anybody here in Texas can pretty much get a gun. They can wear a gun. They can, you know, they can wear a, a samurai gun. sword for all we know. <laughs> yeah, but I just, but I just want people because you know to to learn and and do something so they learn how to properly secure their weapon and care for it. So yeah, no, it makes total sense. Um, getting back to the Kiki thing real quick. So um, how did it feel for you guys? You know, being in that community, um, they're they're obviously were arrests made for both of those individuals that were in charge of that horrendous thing, but there was also evidence of them operating out of their jail cells and still running things. How does that make you feel? Like you, you, you put someone, uh, put someone away, quote unquote, but like, right. So unfortunately that happens from time to time, regardless of if it's a, a someone who's been arrested, uh, for drugs or for any type of other organized crime, you hear that they're still able to operate out of their jail or, or the federal pen or something like that. Obviously those situations are frustrating with the DEA. They do a really good job of, of, of going back and making what's called, you know, historical cases on people where, um, well, the investigation doesn't stop. So, um, interesting whether, you know, the, the cases that they make on, on individuals don't just involve, you know, drugs that they get in real time fashion. If they can go back and historically, show how people were involved in facilitating drug transactions. They can put those charges on people and put them away and stuff. So, but no question it's frustrating because you like to think like, again, as a person, like, you know, that person was caught and they're being punished mm-hmm. and now they're out, right? They're in timeout, yeah. for example, right? Well, unfortunately that, that isn't always the case. Um, and they continue to, to operate, uh, albeit in a different manner because they're behind bars, but no, that's frustrating. I think that's also frustrating because, you know, we feel like the, our jails and our penitentiaries, our federal pens here in, in the U.S. are are better than those ones that exist in other countries and stuff where inmates sometimes are housed and it might be more, it might be easier for them to stay in the game, you know, regardless of what their, you know, criminal interests are and stuff. And so that's why the U.S. typically seeks to extradite people and bring them into our country so that we can... Uh, try to better safeguard against things like that happening. It, it's funny you say that. I actually, uh, I, I actually spoke with somebody that used to be a corrections officer last Thursday, uh-huh. and he was telling me how frequent it was that other corrections officers, depending on the officer, some might run a tight ship where nothing gets by. Some might allow certain things just to maintain the peace, and then others might be bought off yeah. to bring in cell phones, to bring in drugs. to And it's it's interesting that you say it because he, I mean, he's worked here in Texas right. at, a, at, a, at a out of Gatesville. Huh. And he's like, dude, <clears throat> I've literally seen it all. I was only there for a year and a half, but I've literally seen yeah. like all of those aspects, even though, you know, it is in the States. Right. So, you know, jails operate differently here in Texas. And we're, we're uh, uh, our jail operates in a manner we have, our detention officers are in the pods themselves, right? A lot oh, of jails actually don't have detention officers in the pods, right? And we've found that we actually have fewer incidents in our jail, fewer assaults, fewer uh, situations that happen in our in the pods because we have detention officers there with the inmates who have received training on you know conflict resolution and how to de-escalate things and stuff like that. Uh, versus those jails where they don't have, you know, officers in the pods 24-7 where you develop, uh, you know, there are situations where you get like a, 
a, a, like a pod boss, if you will, right? They get these, you know, folks who kind of run their inmates that run the pods and stuff. And so you get typically on average more violent incidents and stuff like that. So that's one of the things you can talk to David about after if you guys aren't, yeah, eating, yeah, yeah. If you guys aren't eating another meal. Um, we probably are. <laughs> <laughs> now I'm just going to rub it in. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that's something that David is very familiar yeah. with and stuff. So, but we're really proud of the facility we run in, but it's, it's true though, to your point though, it's a skill that detention officers develop on how to, you know, keep the peace among folks and stuff. And again, going back to what I was saying before, I mean, we treat everyone with respect. We treat everyone. When you're in the county jail, you've been accused of a crime, right? You haven't been convicted of anything, right? These guys were in prison, so they were definitely convicted. Well, that's true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. But I mean, everyone develops their own way to, you know, deal with folks in a, in a way that you hope is leads to the most successful outcome. Yeah, and I mean, it's a lot of people too. Like uh, he was talking about 150 people per two guards. That's Like yeah. that's insane. Um, and one last thing that I wanted to kind of, I know you have to get out of here. So I'm watching you get antsy. Um, <laughs> uh, so you'd mentioned earlier that the 7-Eleven that you and Mike, your previous partner, that's right. had kind of talked about that um, possibility or just even joked about it. Um, but is legalization and regulation uh, a possible solution? And then, I mean, do you think that would be effective? So we've seen, obviously, the movement in this country is to legalize marijuana, right? Mm -hmm. um, and you see even some uh, cities in Texas have already gone to simply like citing people and stuff. I can tell you when we here in, in Collin County, when our deputies encounter someone who has a joint or something like that, we dispose of it, you know, we're... It, um, I don't think legalizing all drugs is the answer. Um, and, you know, when I gave that example about people coming in and using, it was just kind of like a theoretical. You sure, know, what yeah. If we did something like this, I wonder what that would look like. And, um, But I don't think, you know, legalizing. And then obviously large quantities of drugs, you know, in my opinion, you know, there's a volume aspect of things. There's a threshold in my mind that um, I think goes beyond the pale. Um, I mean, yeah, if you've got distribution amounts, obviously that's a completely different story than if you have personal consumption. Right. Um, and that's why I was curious because like other, some other countries where like that was prevalent um, in Amsterdam as a city is, is an interesting example because a lot of it is legalized, but it's also heavily regulated. So you have those facilities that are testing for purity. They're testing for concentration. They're making sure there's no fentanyl. So like right. you have those safer places to go to do that. Not saying that's probably a great lifestyle to have, right. but at the same time, the safety aspect, which is you were you were alluding to earlier, like even the the drugs that you guys were targeting weren't necessarily the party have fun drugs, but they were the drugs that caused right. violence and death and and you know overdoses and stuff like that. And right. so, so we're getting, we're getting back to uh, let's just talk about marijuana specifically. A lot of people use marijuana um, to self medicate because they're suffering from other things, right? I'll give you a great example. We had this uh, gentleman that died in our facility uh, who was arrested by a local uh, law enforcement agency and brought to our jail, clearly in the throes of a mental health uh, mm -hmm. episode. He was he was basically essentially arrested for causing a disturbance uh, in a shopping center, but he had a had a joint on him. So he was taken to a hospital and, and, and dosed with Ad Ativan, actually two doses of Ativan, which is actually a, is a powerful depressant, right? And he was brought into our facility. Uh, we weren't informed that he was, uh, had received those, <clears throat> that uh, depressant and stuff. And so he, he looks fine. He's talking fine when he's going through the, uh, the, admit, the, the admittance process, right, to be booked in. And then a couple hours later, those narcotics wear off, and this guy's back into a, a full-blown psychotic episode. And then through a certain series of terrible things that happened, this gentleman actually died. Uh, in my opinion, he never should have been brought to the Collin County Jail. This person was basically arrested for having a joint, right, and, and creating a disturbance. He should have been taken to get the help he needed. Um, this same gentleman had, had been handled by Frisco PD, and they took him to There was a wonderful facility here in Frisco that they took uh, – that they take uh, – mental health consumers too, and they're treated, these people that work in that facility, they don't even have guns on them. They know how to talk to people, how to treat people, and, uh, and and deal with them effectively. So really, a lot of what I think 
that's why, you know, when I, when I think in my mind about personal use quantities of drugs, I really wonder what the underlying problem is and seeing if there's better ways to treat those things um, be, rather than being taken to the, the county jail. But in Collin County, we don't have a, a county health facility, right? The, so uh, unfortunately, the Collin County Jail is the <laughs> place where people get taken, right? And so we're working with our commissioner's court and our county judge on a, on a countywide diversion program, and there are people uh, at these different organizations that share our, our, our same belief, and we're in the process of actually getting a true diversion program here in Collin County to more effectively treat these folks uh, and get them the treatment that they need. Uh, well, you right? guys are, so your, your detention officers aren't trained in that and having people, like having an actual budget for a facility for folks that are trained to handle those situations makes a lot more sense. That's right. Our folks do receive training on how to deal with like mental health consumers and people that are in the throes of, a, of an episode. The, the circumstances that led this particular gentleman to pass away has been well documented. We had some people that committed some policy violations who lost their jobs, and um, and it was just a series of unfortunate events. Uh, but uh, we routinely have people. Our infirmary is full constantly. Our infirmary isn't big enough to treat all the mental health consumers. Like we have, on average, about a thousand people in our jail. And I think it's 46% of them are mental health consumers, Jeez. right? So you have people that are in pods with other folks that uh, um, that are mixed in, right? And so part of the jail expansion that we're undergoing now, you were at our facility the other day, and you saw that construction that was going on there yeah, yeah. in our jail, and they're going to build a bigger infirmary, and we're going to have areas that where you can treat better treat people and house people that need to be separated mainly, you know, from other uh regular inmates, if you will. Yeah, that makes total sense. Um, I, I appreciate you stopping in. Um, I, I know your schedule's a little tight these days, which is why you're the first guest I think we'll have on that's like at a two o'clock time. Um, so I've never had that, so that'll I be appreciate interesting. appreciate that. Yeah. I didn't get a meal, I appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, he will forever keep this going. Oh. I, I believe that I will never, ever forget about the fact that he didn't get a meal and Dave did. Yeah. <laughs> um, thank you guys for tuning in. Um, it's Hey Bob podcast on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube. Um, if, if you're listening to us, um, it is interesting listening at 1.25 speed. If you guys are a little bit tight on time, um, any, any particular website or, um, I don't know, account that you'd want to plug in regards to like the Collin County sheriff's department or anything like that no we've got we actually have uh openings I, i've talked to you about this offline we actually i think on the last episode i talked about how we actually have fewer vacancies than than most law enforcement agencies uh have because Collin county is a very desirable place to work our, our salaries are very competitive our benefits packages are very competitive um you can't get better health insurance um our retirement benefits are fantastic, but we do have some openings in detention and for deputy sheriffs. So anybody who's interested in lateraling over from another law enforcement organization and coming to work as a patrol deputy, uh, and then maybe working in CID or some other uh, unit in our office, uh, or just if they want to high school graduates just getting out of high school, they're looking for a job, come work as a detention officer. If you want to see if the law enforcement field is something for you uh we we have openings and and come check out the collin county website and uh we'll we'll get you plugged in cool well matt thank you so much for stopping Appreciate in, you man. brother always all right y'all thank you so much and we'll see you in the next one